All right. Hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 27th, 2023. I hope everybody enjoyed the Christmas season with family and friends. You know, often many of us in the midst of our unbelieving family members, but we remember the reason for the season. I know it's not where we or most of us here believe that Christ was actually born, but it's no less the place where at least the world, even though they don't all observe Christ, they know why Christmas is Christmas. So at least it triggers, at least the thought of Christ comes into their minds at this time, and uh, hopefully many more wake up to him. And today, we are just going to keep going and keep going. We are going to dig deep. I don't know how long this one's going to go. I feel it's going to be longer. But again, you guys will know by this point. And I'm going to say right off the bat, this one today is going deep. So for people that are new, if you're just coming across this ministry for the first time, I this is another one of those videos. I don't recommend you start here. I recommend, like I do in all of my videos, that you come to this playlist right here and come to this one right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. Watch the first four videos. The first one is about 22 minutes that will give you an overview of the next three videos. The next two videos are 30 minutes each. They're all Bible study. Everything is backed by scripture. And then the fourth one is a big video. And these will reveal to you the mysteries of the end of days and how to understand prophecy as it has never been understood before. Because you're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to hear things like 14 years. And you're going to say, this guy has lost his mind. I promise you, with absolutely everything I am, it is all true. The differences in the Gospels are prophetic insights. Every single one of them. We have revealed dozens and dozens of them that show that the differences in the Gospels are not contradictions. They, they're, they're not a controversy that, that should have people question if the, if the Gospels were simply written by men and not spirit-led. They were absolutely, unequivocally, 100% spirit-led, and the mysteries of them are the revelation of the end of days. And that's where this ministry all began in 2017. Uh, it started in June of 2017, but on September 8th, something happened. I knew something happened. I caught something, and I started digging into it from that day forward, and the, the, the revelations have exploded ever since mysteries hidden since the creation since the foundation of the earth are being revealed and they have been for over six years i know it sounds like a big bloated thing no i promise you it's not it's not arrogance and pride and saying oh yeah look at no 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 it is the revelation of jesus christ why did he give us his revelation if he wasn't going to make it eventually known to us we have been given it here, and we have proven that fact for years. And tonight, we are going to dig deeper into it. We, and, and when I say deeper into it, we're going to go deeper into understanding, a deeper understanding of this remnant worker bride. The pre-trib is true. The mid-trib is true. The post-trib is true. And it all takes place over a period called above, which is 50 days, and then the 14 years, seven years of seals, and seven years of trumpets begin. And pre, mid, and post are all true. Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew is post. And that's why when you get into the fourth video, the big one in this one, it's called, It's All Because of Matthew. And why? Because unbeknownst to the world of church is we've all been taught for hundreds of years from a from a, an understanding and a foundation in the gospel of Matthew. And, and we've only been taught to look to Mark and to look to Luke and the synoptic gospels as just added detail. But what's happened is they've done that in the perspective of the is to try to understand the is to come. And that's why everybody has only seen seven years and they have battled and fought and argued and disputed and debated back and forth whether pre, mid, and post are all true. 
once you realize the revelation revealed here, you will know for yourself that pre, mid, and post are all true in a period of above 50 days and 14 years. We've even been able to take it all the way back to the literal creation. It's mind-blowing. So you can do that here, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com, as you see right here. And, <clears throat> excuse me, or you can do it right here. And when you do that, you can go to the intro page. And from the intro page, uh, just watch video one, two, three, and then four. And once you study it, once you take it and you, you ponder it and you pray over it, then go to the deeper videos that follow. Because the fifth video is like a three-hour long video on greater depth of detail of what the 30-minute video of the intro to the Gospels was talking about. And what you'll come to find out is that within these Gospels, not only is there a pre, a mid, a post, but there are worker portions as well. And when it comes to Luke's group, when the pre-trip pre bride is taken out, there's a remnant group of Gentile bride that remains to work for the Lord. Excuse me, that serve the Lord. They follow him when he comes as the son of man, when he returns from the wedding. From the beginning of the 50 days, the pre-trib, there's a seven-day wedding in heaven. He returns on the eighth day. And when he returns on the eighth day, he's here for 40 days as the son of man, the white horse rider. And this group of remnant bride that remain to be his servants, they will be with him for those 40 days. He will open up greater understanding to them, and they will be here till the end of seals. That's right. I've often wondered, and it's been curious as to whether they would also maybe be here during trumpets. But I believe we're going to see more clearly tonight that they're here till the end of seals. But as we know, they're brought back. They're the resurrected ones at the end of trumpets. And you're going to see something tonight in a couple places of scripture that I believe are going to blow your mind. One, as we get started, and this is why I say, you know, for new people, you don't want to begin with this video because this is going deep in depth to the differences in how the Gospels are speaking to different groups and certain people within those different groups along the way. And so, as I said, there was a worker group for Luke that remains during seals. There's an end of Mark and a portion of them that work during trumpets. And then at the end of tribulation, there's a there's a worker group from the tribes that work during the millennial reign. But we know they're not the only ones during the millennial reign. They're simply the ones at the end of tribulation, when the millennial reign begins, they're going out to teach the people the ways to come and observe the ways of the Lord. No more preaching because he'll be on the earth for the millennial reign, but teaching his ways. But there's also the other group, the resurrected group, who were that first remnant Gentile bride who are resurrected to reign and as priests and to reign with Christ during the thousand years. We're going to talk about them more today because they play a very big role in the end of days from being a very select group for being with the Son of Man for 40 days, for then remaining during seals, then being resurrected to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. You see, that's a big deal. So well, what about the other workers? Well, there's the John worker group as well, which relates to the apostles. And there is a new group of apostles that will be here on the earth during the time of seals. And then the 144 that work during trumpets. So during seals, there's two worker groups. As we know, there's the trumpet, uh, uh, there's the apostles, and there's the disciples. But the, the apostles, the 144, and the 12 tribes that work during the millennial reign, when it's all over at the end of the millennial reign, we see New Jerusalem coming down that is described by all three of them. But the one that isn't described is the disciple group from Luke, who was there with him for 40 days, who remains during seals, and will be resurrected for uh, at the end of trumpets, at the end of tribulation, to rule and reign with them as priests, during the thousand years that's their reward being with them there and you're going to see this in ways you've never seen it before and it's two part both parts of this actually because i'm going to be going into um the the book of joel tonight 
And we're going to cover the book of Joel 1, 2, and 3. We've done this about two and a half years ago, but we're going to do it again because I'm going to show you something that from a video that was shared with me by a brother, uh, Clive, he sends me, he does a lot of great digging, and he sent me a couple of uh, videos recently. One that I'm going to start today's video with as we get going that I posted in the forum. And for anybody that hears me say about the forum, we've got about 1,200 people around the world. Go to ministryrevealed.com. Take you a few seconds to sign up. It's free. And um, we're posting about all sorts of things, you know, Bible studies and questions and comments and and prayer requests and news and, and events around the world and so forth. And I posted it in there and there were some great clips. And I'm going to open with this clip to to get the mindset ready, even though most of you, if not all of you watching, unless you're newer, have understood these things. I want you to hear from somebody else from another perspective in a video that's uh, a little over four years ago. So you can see it, you can get your mind ready, and we're going to go into the Joel portion in the second half because there's something that we've been speaking about for about the last couple of years. I bring it up every once in a while, and I recently spoke about it as well, and that is the teacher of righteousness and, and the community of people, not just the teacher of righteousness, but the community of people that they are all a part of. And yes, I'm speaking to us. I'm not saying unequivocally, but we have seen the evidence and there's no other ministry on earth that has been given these revelations without dreams, visions, visitations, none of these things. It is all through the leading of the spirit in the will of the father that the revelations are coming and it simply had to happen somewhere to somebody. And for some reason, it would seem he's chosen us. So we're going to touch on this again. And the reason we're going to touch on it in the latter half is because in the recent video when we were talking about it, I was telling you guys, I'm not so sure whether us as, you know, as as the 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 teacher, potentially teacher of righteousness and the group with them, whether they would stay during seals. There was a whole bunch of evidence that seems to tell us, yes, as that remnant worker, the, the watchman, right? The, the, the modern day Essenes. There were those from the was, which is Old Testament to Christ, the is, which is from Christ to the pre-trib, and then the is to come, which is pre-trib to the end. I mean, which is, yeah, from the pre-trib escape to the end of, the, the end of everything. And so there was the Essene group, who were the was foreseeing the understanding coming into the is when Christ came. And there's a group of watchmen being revealed with, I believe, a teacher of righteousness for which there's a group and they're preparing for the apocalyptic time. That's their view. That's what's happening here. And they're being ready for this time just as they were. And a group of them had become part of the 14ers back in those days. They'd become Christians. They, they had come and they started following the ways of the Lord because that's what they were watching for. And I'm going to show you all these things. They had believed that, that that guy back in those days, that he was a Moses quote unquote type, which we know is a Moses John the Baptist type in the is to come. Because we've shown many times with the Moses John the Baptist type that he that John the Baptist is beheaded by the end of the sixth year of seals, that Moses in the picture of them being in the wilderness and the portable tent, which is, which is still the flesh because it's still the time of the Gentiles. And Moses never got to go to the promised land because Yeshua, Joshua shows up and he's the one that takes them. And that's the great mid-trib, great multitude rapture. So we know these typologies, which means Whoever this person is in this group that, that's a part of them, that there's a, a preparing taking place. And this preparing and where we find it and where it's connected to in a piece of scripture that literally says, teacher of righteousness. I had never seen it before. But because of another video that our brother Clive sent, I was going through it and I paused it right there and I started studying through it to see what this connection was. 
You see, there's a camp of people that say, well, Jesus is the teacher of righteousness and Jesus is the ultimate teacher of righteousness. But the teacher of righteousness that was prophesied, who was written and who wrote about it in 2100 years ago and was the teacher of righteousness from the was into the is, there was a prophetic one in the final generation from the is preparing for the is to come. And this preparing you're going to see is going to go to the end of the sixth year of seals. You see, this is why I'm bringing it up, because we have spoken and have shown that within this, maybe it was at the beginning, because when the Son of Man comes, he has a meal and he opens up their understanding. So it was possible that, hey, maybe it was going to happen there, and maybe it wouldn't be through to the end of seals. And we've spoken about this. I didn't really know where it was, you know, like many of you, many of you guys have asked me, knowing what I understand in Scripture and all of these revelations, that many of you have fully come to understand that, you know, have I been told, have I been shown, has the Lord led me to more understanding that I'm indeed going to be staying? And I always tell you guys, no, but he never speaks to me like that. It is all through his word and through the revelation of Jesus, through the revelation of Scripture, the word. And so I, I, we seem to be getting closer and closer and closer to understanding that we keep getting these clues and these, these prophetic insights within Scripture. Well, today, I believe we've gotten it. We've literally received it. And I'm going to show it to you in that latter half. But before we get there, because it's in Joel, and for those who have been around for a while, I always remember our brother Ivan uh, in South Africa, and he had said, you know, like the chapters to years. For those of you who know the chapters to years right here, you know, I remember him making a comment after that video because we understand John, uh, uh, sorry, Joel chapter one is like the, 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 the pre, the 40 days of the Son of Man here. The Joel chapter two is the end of seals and Joel chapter three is the end of trumpets. And he had made a comment that, hey, it's like our chapters to years, but it's one one book to chapter, one book to chapter, one book to chapter. And so, you know, I always remembered him saying that. And it, it's it's true. We, we've been able to understand it. We've shown it. Well, what I'm going to show you when we get into chapter two of Joel, when we get into it in the latter portion. Your jaw is going to hit the floor when we build up to the revelation that shows it, where it literally says, teacher of righteousness. It's awesome. It's mind-blowing. I was freaking out last night, and I was showing my wife, because, like I said, as many of you are searching to understand, are you truly, are, are you going to be a worker? You see, we are ready. Most of us don't really know but I believe after tonight, if you have understood these revelations, if you've been following along, if you stick to it, you remain in the word, you're diligently seeking him, you're a watchman, you're loving, you're repentant, and you stick with it. Keep going. Keep, keep digging into the revelations. Keep searching them out. Keep studying. Keep praying over them. And I will continue and continue, and many people share within the ministry. That's how I know people are really getting it when they start sharing insights that they find. And then we build on them and build on them. Because I believe 100% that a, a, a strong number, a good portion of us here in this ministry are unequivocally being prepared to remain girded about, ready when he returns from the wedding. And I'm going to show you more of this tonight. And as I get started here now, I'm going to start with this other video clip and bring it into the parable of the sower within the Synoptic Gospels and show these differences. And what really caught my attention was something when we get to the Gospel of Matthew and his story. When we get there, I think you're going to see something you've never understood before. And we've never talked about it before because I haven't understood it before, but maybe some of you have. So get ready because we're going deep. And for anybody new, please pause and really go take the time to study those other videos first. So let's get started here.
this is that first video. This is the one I told you guys that I shared in the forum that was shared a few days ago by our brother Clive. It's a great video. This guy really has a sense of it, but he, of course he doesn't yet understand. And I mean, this was four years ago, but I don't believe he still understands because <laughs> I try to share the 14 years and the differences in the gospels. We haven't had, excuse me, much luck yet, right? Reaching people that have a bigger audience. And, but what he does have is he's got a lot of the foundation understanding of a group for which this will happen to again. Okay? So he's he's got really good teachings, but because he still only understands seven years and not 14 years, he, he, he talks in the pre properly, but because we know there's two weddings, there's one at the beginning of the Gentile wedding, there's one at the end of Jewish wedding, he's not aware of this, and he's got this, com th this kind of combines it as he gets to the end of the video. So for anybody that wants to watch it, I would recommend watch the whole thing. But knowing what you know here, be aware of it when you're listening. Because along the way, he's got some great things. And I wanted to share this piece with you here so that you can understand what I'm talking about. The reason I'm trying to, again, I'm linking wisdom to Messiah in this one. So what am I suggesting? We've had this quote here, my, you know, Psalm 78, I open my mouth in a parable, I utter riddles of old. And then in Proverbs 8, we have wisdom saying, listen to my words, and the opening of my lips is about straightness. My mouth speaks truth. Now, please note that the, the here, give ear to my Torah. My mouth, wisdom says my mouth speaks truth. Truth and Torah are interchangeable. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. They are possessed me as the first of his works of old. So when Yeshua was giving the parables, he was speaking the wisdom from the foundation of the earth. And I believe that, like Messiah said, this is the fulfillment of these passages. Yeshua said all this to the crowd in parables. He did not speak to them without a parable. So that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I shall open my mouth in parables, I shall pour forth what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. And he answering said to them, because it has been given to you to know the secrets, the riddles of the reign of the heavens, but to them it has not been given. So here, you should, what I'm saying is, Yeshua is wisdom incarnate, that's one thing, and that he's speaking the riddles and things from the foundation of the earth. But what we have here is that only a select group within Yah's people are given that true wisdom to understand these things. In Yeshua giving the parables of the secrets of the reign of the heavens, he was uttering the parables and riddles of old. Does that make sense? Yeshua said that, well, the gospel says that was the fulfillment of it, which implies that this can be fulfilled again if somebody else has that wisdom. Because did Yeshua give everything he had to his disciples? Absolutely he did. He gave them the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. Those who understand the parables will find life. As it says in Proverbs 8.35, for whoever finds me shall find life and obtain favor from Yah. Beautiful. You see... Knowing that it happened before and it was fulfilled, it will be fulfilled again. That there is a person and a group of people for which it will come to again. This is what we talk about. He understands that it's going to happen to a group of people again. But you see where he is? He's in the Gospel of Matthew. So is it going to happen again? Yes, but everybody goes to the gospel of matthew because that is the foundation of the church is the gospel of matthew because it's the first book and it's got the stuff there so they because there's no understanding of the differences in the gospels and the purpose for these differences everybody goes to matthew and then just looks to mark and to luke as little fillers but why do they do it the number one reason is because they can't explain the differences you can't go explain it in one and it says it this way, and then go explain it in another, and it's, it's got the story differently. Something is going on. And that's what we revealed here in this ministry. And so that's all the way back to the start in, in 2017. But you see, he gets it. Regardless of the 14 years, regardless of these differences in the Gospels, he understands that it is going to happen again, where the Lord is going to reveal his secrets and his mysteries to another group in the end of days. But now let's bring clarity to it, you see, because he, he said it from Matthew. But where he was speaking that from had nothing to do with the beginning and was all about the end. It's just like when people go to Matthew 24 and talk about the coming of the Lord that literally says immediately after the tribulation of those days. They, they tend to skip over that and say, see, this is the coming of the Lord. This is the pre-trib rapture. 
It'll be as it was in the days of Noah. They have no understanding that that's literally the final 14th year of tribulation. We've revealed what it means here. So what we're going to do is we're not going to start in the parable of the sower in Matthew, but we're going to start in the beginning. We're going to start in Luke where the parable of the sower is because Luke's is the beginning. So Luke, what you'll often find, or Mark or Matthew, is it speaks to this the pre-trib group, and then there's we know there's a remnant from them. And then Matthew, uh, uh, Mark, is to the mid-trib group, and there's a remnant from them, okay, which is the 144,000. And then there's the Matthew group, and to them, it's the 12 tribes. So it, it's, the, it's the trumpets, but then to the end of trumpets, and we know that there's the 12 tribes that will go out during the millennial reign. However, remember this, as I said earlier, there's also a group who is resurrected, who will take part in reigning with Christ, who were the ones chosen from Luke. All right? So let's go through this. Um, so it's the parable of the sower. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, let's just start in four. When much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, speck a parable, a sower went out to sow seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell on a rock. And as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Right? It lacked watering. It lacked the word. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. And others fell on the ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. This hundredfold is only used in Luke's gospel. The hundredfold in Mark and the hundredfold in Matthew are not the exact same one. But you'll have to remember something. In the hundredfold, the sixtyfold, the thirtyfold, who are the hundredfold? Only Luke's mentions only the hundredfold. Why did this make a difference for us? Well, you guys will remember this. This is from the Apocrypha book. Um, uh, actually, this is from the Fragments. Uh, fragment 5 from the Apocrypha, which we've shared. That, that just like 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as we've shared many times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, one of my favorite pieces of scripture that proves pre, mid, and post over a period of above and 14 years, we see that Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above, which is the 50 days, 14 years ago. And this one is the one in Christ that is like a rapture, like a harpazo that's taken to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, meaning not fully in Christ like the first one, but, you know, kind of, sort of, like the first one. And this one was caught up into paradise. This is the prophetic imagery that we're given in this. And we see as you go down, he then says, in verse 14, behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. I won't bring you any more burden. I don't seek you or yours or your children, but I seek you. Because you see, the parents lay up for the children. Okay, for the children, the church, the bride, they're, they're the children. Judah are the parents, right? The Jews, you could say, are the parents. That's why it's coming against them first. And that's why you're going to see things like when we get into this, that uh, uh, the children of Zion, especially when, when we get into uh, Joel chapter 2, the end of seals, is the prophetic picture there. So we see here, this is what? The ones that go to the third heaven. This is the pre-trib bride of Christ in the above 14 years when the 50 days starts. And then you have such a man that was caught up that goes to paradise. These, these are both, the third heaven and paradise are part of the kingdom of God. This is Luke's group. This is Mark's group. And when he's then coming to them, so there was a taking away, a taking away, and a returning. So the return is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, and he's establishing the kingdom of heaven. These two are the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven is for Matthew when he returns feet down. Okay, so we can see this. Third heaven, paradise, and then returning feet down. Well, look at what it says here. In the ancient scroll from the Apocrypha fragments, it says, but there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that of those who produce sixtyfold and that of those who produce thirtyfold. 
for the first, which is the hundredfold, will be taken into the heavens. The second class will dwell in paradise. That's the 60-fold. And the last will inhabit the city. That's the 30-fold. You see, there was the, the chapter before it where it even said to, to heaven, to paradise, and, of course, remain for the city. Something, again, that we've covered in the past. So we know that those who are part of the hundredfold in the pre-trib, those are the ones going to the third heaven, those that are part of the hundredfold. So it means everybody that that is in Christ, spirit-filled, praying for others. It's not just about, you know, the number of people, oh, I got a hundredfold people to, to come to Christ. And sometimes I would say it probably even counts for prayers. Prayers, 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 they're so powerful, right? And especially at this time of year for family and friends that don't believe. Prayers. And, of course, sharing. Absolutely sharing, right? I got brother Steve in Uganda. That him and his team, I mean, it's an abundance of going out and spreading in missions all throughout Uganda and surrounding areas. Okay? There are ways that we can do these things. And in, in doing what we're doing here. You know, another way is um, I was talking with our brother Olu, and I was thinking, you know, what if people within the ministry started to gather, do uh, um, Bible studies? But you guys set the tone for Bible studies. Why not do Bible studies and have them be prophecy-based? And maybe if you have the book or you get the printout, because you can print it out for free, just print out chapter one for everybody, all about the differences in the Gospels, and you could easily spend a month or two in your in a weekly Bible study for an hour or so, however long you do it, and have that small group and have them read it and then see what else they could find within the scriptures and go with the questions back and forth. That would be another way, right? I thought that would be an awesome idea. We'll talk about it more in the future. So here we are with this hundredfold. So we see this pre-trib group, the group going to the third heaven, but from them... We know there's a group that remains. And who is this group that remains? Listen to this. This is where it gets interesting once this wording starts. In Luke 8, verse 9, And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries. Plural. It is given to know the mysteries, which is what? The abundance of mysteries. Not a single one, but an abundance of mysteries. Does it mean every mystery? No, of course not. But to know an abundance of the mysteries, okay? Not a single one. It is un given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the others in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. No, the, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Guys, it is all about the word of God. You see, as we go through these parables here with the sower, we can clearly see that there are people who come to believe. They, they receive it with joy. They're fine for a little while. And then the cares of this life take them away. It completely, utterly destroys once saved, always saved. Doesn't mean they can't come back. It doesn't mean... You know, they're they're on their deathbed and they can't cry out in repentance to the Lord and come to the Lord and they'll be in paradise. Absolutely. This is this is what the, when you're going to see as we go further into it, when it comes to the end of seals and you're going to see this when we get to the end of Joel chapter two. When it comes to the end of seals, the Gentile age is over. You it's going to be simply a matter of when the end of seals comes crying out to the Lord calling on his name you can go to paradise you see that's what happens to people now just like the guy on the cross right the one that was on the right side of the cross from christ what happened to him simply cried out right he repented to the lord believing he was who he was in what he said and he got to be with the lord in paradise you see but that's the church that's that's where the that's where those who will endure seals being saved in seals and waking up in seals, that's why they're there. It's their final chance to the end of seals to wake up, and at the end, those who are still alive call out to the Lord. Those who are being beheaded along the way, well, the reason they're dying along the way 
is because of the name of the Lord. So they, they're declaring the Lord. That's why they're all going to paradise. Those who are spirit-filled, <clears throat> those who are in Christ, those who are loving, repentant, diligently seeking him, as the scripture says. You see, not everybody goes to the same place. Not everybody has the same rewards. And when it comes to the rewards for this disciple group, for this remnant Luke Gentile bride remaining to serve the Lord group, theirs is a portion of many different things. Now, this is why it's so important, guys. It's the word of God. This is, this is the big distinguishing factor in, in everybody's story. If you don't spend time in the word, how are you going to get any closer to the Lord? He left us, he left his books, he wrote us a bunch of letters and love letters and things that he did throughout his life and throughout his days and his time. All the way back to his creation. He told us what's going to be taking place in the end and people think that you can just love the Lord and know nothing about him. If 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 you were gone on a long trip or you were gone to war like they did in World War II and they wrote letters back and you were in love with that person that was over there in war and they were sending you letters and you were getting letters every week or every couple weeks, did you would you just throw them in the garbage or disregard them? Or did you want to know what your love was doing over there? Or what your love was doing back home who was sending you letters? You want to read those letters and be encouraged and be strengthened and be hopeful. That's what the Lord gave us. This is how we come to know who the Lord is. This is how we draw closer to him. It's the word of God. That is the seed. So then we see, okay, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh the word out of, listen to this. Where does the devil take the word out of? The devil takes it out of their hearts, which means they received it, you see? Lest they should believe and be saved. The devil comes and snatches it away from them. You see, some of these things, I don't know if we can ever really understand them. Because it's, it's the Lord's will. Why does somebody who receive it, before it really sinks in, the devil's able to take it away? 13. Then on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. You see? And these have no root uh, for which a while believe. You see that? You're going to try and tell me once saved, always saved, and, and read that and say, well, they didn't really believe? The Bible, Jesus' words, he's telling, saying, they did believe. They believed for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. This right here, this conversation is in the time we're living right now, over these last 2,000 years. And from a group of this, there's a group remaining. You see, that's why it started with the disciples. But this is talking about like a time that we're in now. <laughs> and then... This group of disciples who is who are given the mysteries, who are given the mysteries, will then be the group that takes it through when the time of the end begins. So it says, uh, verse 14, and that which fell among the thorns are they which, when they heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, listen to this, keep it. Keep it. What are they keeping? The word. Well, what is the word? It's the seed. The seed is the word. Christ is the word. There is letters to us. And if people keep it, if they seek them out in it, if they search it, if they pray over it, they keep it. You see? It's one of the reasons I don't generally show my face. I would rather do videos where we're digging and digging into the Word. And if I do, we're still digging into the Word. 
We want to keep his word in us always, diligently seeking him and not get caught up, listen to this, in the cares and the riches and pleasures of this life. Sounds like Luke 21, right? Luke 21, 34, right? Don't be caught off guard when that day comes. Let's go look at it. Luke 21, I know 36 very well, but I always mix up 34, 35. Watch this. 34 and 35. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares. You see, I'm showing you plurals for a reason. And cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy, which we covered again just recently in another video, in the pre-trib one, right? To escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the pre-trib verse right here. But you see, don't get caught up with the cares of this life. Who is he talking to? Believers. Those who have believed. Don't get caught up. Don't get distracted with these things in this life and fall away. Don't let the devil come and take it from you. So see, in Luke, this is the end of it. Okay? Who are the ones that are receiving the mysteries? Well, knowing that in when we're looking at this with an end time eye, we know that the disciples are the Luke group, the Luke 24 group, that remnant group behind. And that just like the guy's video said, did he reveal these things to his disciples? Yes, he did. And we see that in the is picture when we talk about it here in Luke chapter 24 with the two on the road to Emmaus in relation to the disciples. Uh, that he spake these words that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Okay. In this, is he revealing everything? No, but he's revealing a lot. He's in, and in the is to come, this group is that disciple group from Luke 8. It's that disciple group. It's that remnant bride worker that's going to serve him. And when he comes, he's going to have a meal with them and he's going to open their understanding. So when we read this and knowing that this is where he opens their understanding, it's clear that they're not going to be part of the pre-trib. So the teacher of righteousness and that group of them that are being given these things in advance to prepare them for this time. When this happens, why would he give them the understanding and then say, OK, all of you guys can now leave? We've talked about this many times over the years. You don't give your playbook to to your to your team and after you give them the playbook say okay all you guys go home and we're going to put all the backup players on to go beat the you know the toughest guys on the other side makes no sense so we can see that indeed this group is going to remain and we're going to see as we go through this they're going to go to the end of seals clearly to the end of seals and then of course come back at the end of trumpets for the millennial reign so this is that group from Luke chapter 8 who are the ones who he says, these disciples that are given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So there they were from Luke 24. We've talked about them many times. We understand who they are. It's that Smyrna group who, who were the original 14thers, and there's 14ers now, and, and all these things that we've spoken about in the past, and I'm going to touch on that again in a little bit. But... They're given plural mysteries. Do you know what the Lord says in Scripture about to those who, whose much is given? Yes, much is required. But there's another piece of Scripture that says to those who have been given much more is given. Wait until you see what happens when we get to Matthew in relation to this. And remember that it's the disciple group, the Luke 24 remnant workers to whom these mysteries are given. This is what we're being prepared for right now. And it's all what? From the word of God. So this is all you get from the parable in relation to Luke's group. There, there's no condemnation. There's no nothing in it like that. So now let's go see what Mark says. 
Okay, he says it sprang up depth of the earth. <clears throat> so similar, uh, but the sun, uh, verse four, uh, Mark four, verse six. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and it yielded fruit, and sprang up, and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. Remember, it's a different hundred. It's not the same one like the one from Luke. Because that Luke group is that first group that's gone. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a difference of those three that were mentioned. So who would this hundred be? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually related. Because remember, now that we're in this in Mark, this parable isn't only... To, to this portion during seals, although it's like a it's like a conversation. We know that it's a in the life that we're in now, in the is, and you could say for those going to paradise. However, you're going to clearly see that it's also prophetically speaking to a time of tribulation of seals. So it's talking, as I said earlier, to the period of seals, but also giving insight to the time of the end of seals. Okay? And you'll see this as we go forward. So who then is working? Well, you've got the 30, the 60, and the 100. Could the 100 be the remnant from the other 100 from Luke that are working during seals? Could very well be, right? But what do we know happens now at the end of seals? At the end of seals, we know that there's the 144,000 that are sealed. Okay? So listen to what we read in Mark 4, verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him, uh, asked of him the parable. So you have a group with the twelve. So why is this important? Let me show you something. For those that haven't seen this, if you're newer to the channel, <clears throat> the difference between Mark, uh, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke is found in 1 Corinthians 15. And this is, this is, it, it was such a huge revelation when we came across this because the fact that we're always taught from the Gospel of Matthew, everybody is always taught, well, there were 12 apostles. That's it, 12 apostles and, and the story, go, that's it. And then there were some disciple guys following them. Nope, it was more than that. And we know it because look what happens on Resurrection Day, okay? In 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Jesus is resurrected, and it says, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, then, listen to this, the 12. Okay, we we're just talking about the 12. Who do the 12 represent? They represent the 12 tribes. They're talking to Matthew's portion. The 12 represent those who are going to work during the millennial reign that are going to teach of the ways of the Lord throughout the earth. To, to observe the ways of the Lord. And then it says, listen to this in verse 6. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present day, but some are fallen asleep. Remember what it just said? There were some of those with the 12. They were called a group with the 12. We see this one is given no name, you see? It's just a, a larger number which is like the 144,000. This is the Mark group. You see what it said? After that means he met with the 12. These aren't the 12 apostles. Remember in, in tribulation, it says there were 24, 24 uh, um, uh, thrones, <clears throat> right? It was 12 and 12. These are the 12 tribes. They're related to Matthew's group. After that, it's the Mark group, and it relates to those during seals and those dead and those alive, but it also relates to a remnant from among them who are the 144,000. And then look what it says. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And the apostles were what? Twelve. Well, you could say there was 11, but we know they brought on Matthias, so there were 12. So you had a 12. You had a larger number, you had a 12. 
So who is this 12 that he meets with? That's not Luke's group. This is John's group. Okay, this relates to the apostles from John chapter 20. And then we have verse 8. Last of all, he was seen of me also, one born out of due time. Born before her pain began. Okay, Paul is a picture of Luke's group, the pre-trib Gentile bride in Christ before the travailing. Pre-birth, born before any of it started. This is the pre-trib group in Luke. And we know there's the remnant from Luke, as Paul was a type, that would then go and work. So in reverse, you've got Luke's group, you got the apostles, you've got the, the uh, 144,000, the seals uh, at the end of seals, and then you've got the 12 at the end of trumpets. And so when we're reading in Mark that there is a group with the 12, it relates to the 144,000 that are with the 12. That's all that we're seeing there. But you see, there was more than one group was a huge revelation a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, when we saw that there was way more than one group that he met with after his resurrection. It was hugely important because it reveals seven Sabbaths and then 50 days, by the way. <laughs> so as we keep going, we can see now with the 12. So again, the key here is you're seeing this difference that there's no conversation now about the disciples. So this conversation is a picture now at the end of seals, and it's it's the 144,000, and you could say with the 12, because the 12, is they're still there. They're going to be in trumpets, but their work as the tribes are going to be at the end of trumpets during uh, uh, the millennial reign. And he says in verse 11 of Mark 4, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the, look at this, mystery. A single mystery. So when we get to the part and we, we're going to read where it says unto, unto them whom much is given, more is given. Is this much? No. It's a single mystery. He said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Why is this group that is called the with the 12, who are a picture of the 144,000, why are they being given the single mystery of the kingdom of God? Because they're helping bring in the rapture group. Remember? The 144,000, they're sealed before the great multitude rapture because they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture. They're being given understanding of a single mystery about the kingdom of God. And you're going to see how these guys relate to the ones at the end of Luke, I mean, at the end of uh, Mark's gospel, in what he says next. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may not see and not perceive and hearing, uh, they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. That always sounds brutal, doesn't it? Is, don't we want them to hear and to see? If they hear and see, then they would be converted and they would be saved. Their sins would be forgiven. Isn't that what we want, Lord? Not for a certain group, right? Not for a certain group. And that, of course, that's why you see a little bit of it in Mark. You see a little bit of it in Mark, in, in, sorry, in Luke and in Mark. And then in Matthew, it comes to fruition because all along the way, it's about Judah. You see, why is it about Judah? They were blinded for our sakes. So if this is if the coming to the end of this being being marked to the end of seals, this is to the end of the Gentile age. Then it goes back to the days for the Jews. Their eyes will begin to be opened and so forth. Right. By the end of it, by the end of trumpets. You see, if it was before and they were converted, the story would be over. But the Gentiles who are grafted in with the house of Israel have to come in first. And so these guys are being given what? This mystery. So the 144,000 only have the single mystery of the kingdom of God. And, and what is this mystery with them in the kingdom of God? It's the group going to paradise. Because they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture. Now listen to what he tells them in Mark 4.13. And he said unto them, 
Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? You see, what's he saying? You guys don't even understand this one parable? Then how on earth are you going to understand all the others? Well, they won't know them. They were only given the single mystery. They don't understand all the parables. The only group that's given the revelation to these parables in, in multiples of understanding are the disciples from the Luke group. So see, he, he gives them like a little brow beating, right? He's kind of he's kind of giving them a little tongue lashing. Well, does that sound familiar? When we go to Mark chapter 16, as we've shown, if, if you're newer to the channel and you keep watching those videos, there's the video about pre, mid, and post, and it's revealed in a typology within the resurrection, within the transfiguration, and with the triumphal entry. They're all prophetic pictures of pre, mid, and post, or the 40 days of the Son of Man after the pre-trib. And then the end of six years of seals and the end of the seventh year of Trump, uh, sixth year of trumpets. So it's his pre for 40 days, his mid at the end of six years of seals and his post feet down at the end of six years of trumpets. So when we see this here in Mark in the resurrection story, here are those two. See, there's those two that were on the road to Emmaus. So prophetically, there they are at the end of the sixth year of seals. And now he's coming to the 144,000. So they're going to tell the 144,000, hey, it's time, it's time. The Lord's here. Get ready. And they didn't want to believe him, right? They didn't believe him. Look at this. And they went and told it unto the residue, the remaining ones, okay? The, the left behind. He's talking prophetically of the seals remnant workers of the bride who remained to serve him who are now at the end of the six years of seals and who are letting the 144,000, the next group of workers coming, who are going to help bring in the great multitude rapture, and they didn't want to believe them. And so when Jesus appears unto them, he sits, uh, um, as they sat down to eat, listen to this, he unbraided on them, right? He railed on them because they didn't believe what the other two had come to warn them of the Lord's coming. This is related to the 144,000, their unbelief and hardness of heart. And we see what ends up happening, the powers and the abilities that they're going to be given. That's because this takes you to the end of seals. And then they're going to work after they help bring in the great multitude rapture. They're going to work during trumpets. This is related to the 144,000. Why do you think most people believe the 144,000 are going to be sealed first? Because they only understand seven years. You see, if you only understand seven years and you're starting at the end of seals, well, then you got seven years of trumpets. You see, but they fully miss that there's the seven years of seals that come first. And that's why this is the picture of, again, there he is berating, right? Giving the tongue lashing to them for their unbelief that the time was at hand. Here we are in the prophetic picture as the end of seals now, or the, this timing as the end of seals. And he's saying, what, you guys didn't know? How are you going to understand the parables if you didn't even know this? Can't even know this one? You don't know all of them? Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do with you guys? So you got this same type of, of giving them a little tongue lashing. Now, as I said, we also know that this is a prophetic picture of the time during seals, taking them to the end of seals. And look at what it says in verse 17 of Mark 4. Uh, let's start in verse 16, halfway through. Who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, listen to this, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. We can say we know people like that now, right? But how do we know this is actually speaking prophetic? See this persecution and affliction? Here's the word for persecution. Watch this. There's the word for persecution. Let's go have a look at it. There it is, persecution. It's used in Matthew 13 and in Mark 4. Both of these places are the parable of the sower. Okay, You find it nowhere in Luke. 
What else did we see? What's the other word? Affliction. Why is this one so important? Persecution, tribulation, and trouble. Is there daily life persecution and tribulation? Absolutely. But can this also be literally applied prophetically to prove to us that this is a time during seals and in tribulation to the end of seals? Absolutely. Because this word, I'm going to show you where it's found. Many of you guys know this one very well. The word for, tribula uh, for tribulation, there it is in the parable of the sower in Matthew. There it is in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Mark 4 in the parable of the sower. And in Mark 13, Mark 13, discourse of Mark, discourse of Matthew. The discourse of Mark is the tribulation of seals. The discourse of Matthew is the tribulation of trumpets. Hello? And where else are they found? In the parable of the sower of Matthew and the parable of the sower of Mark? Do you think that just magically happened? Or do you think there's prophetic revelation understanding why? You see, these are, the, these are the points, these differences within the Gospels reveal prophetic end-time understanding and timings and groups of people. It's not all one kumbaya, everybody going to the same place all at the same time. There are different rewards and different people being rewarded for different reasons, for different works. Okay? For works, and what I mean, you're not saved by your works. But your works reveal the spirit and you being in Christ. That's it. How you treat people, how you love on people, how, how you help somebody out, how you give water to somebody, that, that you would help out a homeless person, that you support missions, that, that you do different things, that you're in the word, you're spending time with them, you're in prayer. Not like these guys that might receive it. And then things of the world catch them off guard. Somebody offends them in something. They say, oh, no, yeah, I kind of believe in Jesus. No, 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 no. Believe in Jesus? Well, a little bit. No. You think he's going to reward everybody the same like that? Absolutely not. His word tells us he won't. So here we see. This is the Mark group. Those during seals. And this is group. It's, so it's this conversation of the time of seals and these things that will take place also during the time of seals and to the end of it with that group with the 144. Okay. Um, let's see the road, some 30, some 60. All right. So there we go with Mark's portion. Now we're going to go into Matthew's portion. And when we go into Matthew's portion, it gets a lot more detailed and it's going to reveal a lot of things. So here we are in, oh, well, we can even start in 13.7. And, uh, and some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell onto good ground and brought forth roots, some a hundredfold. You see, remember, it's because of a different number. Uh, some 60 and some 30. We know because of the fragments where these different portions go. Now listen to this. Listen to this. This caught my attention right away just yesterday when we come to mark thir uh, sorry matthew 13 verse 10 listen to what it says this time the disciples came what are the disciples doing here well remember when we were in luke we know that it's it's not only a picture of of the the time of, of which we live now but it's also because it's those that are going, right? This hundredfold are those who are going pre-trip. So it's, it's a picture of now, the life we've been living now. And then there's a group who are the disciples who are going to receive the mysteries of the kingdom of God, who are in the word, who are sharing it, who are doing these things. Okay. It, it's, it's the now that we're in and this disciple group. And what does it say? And his disciples asked him saying, Okay, so they were already there, and they asked them. Now, in Mark, we come to the prophetic picture with the, with the group being asked right here. This is a picture of the end of seals, and then the conversation goes into events that took place 
during the time of seals. So here is the end of seals. And who was there? And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked him the parable. Now, when we go to Matthew 13, here we are at this same place and listen to what it says. And the disciples. So if one was representing life is where we were, and then it was that disciple group being chosen, they were there, the, the tribulation had started, and this is them. And then at the end of seals, we know their time is over, and it's the time of the 144, and the 12 are still around because they're going to be there in the millennial reign. We know it goes into trumpets, but there was a discussion of during that time that took place during seals. Now we come to Matthew. And in Matthew, at the same start of this, we're, we're, the picture is we're at the end of trumpets. And then it's going to go give us a discussion of trumpets to the end of trumpets. But it starts with who the group is being acknowledged as if it's the end of trumpets, just like it was the end of seals, just like it was the end of the age we're in, and it was the start of the, the 40 days with the disciples. So listen to what it says. Verse 10 of Matthew 13. The disciples came, which means what? Which means the disciples weren't there. So in the prophetic understanding of it, seeing with our end time eyes, why did the disciples have to come? Well, because they weren't there during trumpets. You see, they were there for the 40 days. They were there during seals. Their time at the end of seals is done. And at the end of trumpets, what happens? You got it. They're the ones resurrected. They're resurrected, and they're going to rule and reign with them, right? So listen to what he says to them. And remember, in, in Luke's chapter, they were given the mysteries of the kingdom of God, plural mysteries. And if they're the resurrected disciples who are being resurrected to reign with them during the millennial reign, don't you think they should be given some other understanding? Well, check this out. So now here they are. They come which means they weren't there and they had to come from somewhere. And the prophetic picture, as I just said, is they're the ones part of the resurrection. And said unto him, unto Jesus, why speakest thou unto them in parables? So now it's as if he's, it's the end of tribulation. It's like he's speaking to the 12. Okay. He might be speaking to the 12 as in the 12 tribes, or he's speaking you could say to, to everybody now assembled at the end of tribulation, those coming to the Lord, it's all over. But we know there's the 12 who are the, still the ones remaining now, right? So he's telling this group of people, and, he, and, and, the, and these disciples show up. And they're asking, hey, why are you telling them about the parables? And in verse 11, Jesus says, and he answered and said unto them, who is he talking to now? He's talking to the disciples. So it's the disciples that show up again. So it's the prophetic picture. The disciples are being resurrected and asking Jesus, why are you speaking the parables unto them? And he answered unto the disciples, unto them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, this group, it is not given. What? Why are the disciples also being given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven? Because remember, the kingdom of heaven is the millennial reign. Who are they? You guessed it. It's the ones from Luke. The disciples in Luke were given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He opened to them their understanding so that more clarity in what they, you see, what we're already being given over these last several years. We're given more and more and more revelation. We're being prepared for the end as watchmen, for those who are diligently seeking him as Enoch. This 14thers who are now 14ers in the end of days, days to years, a group being prepared, revelations being opened that were mysteries kept from the, from the foundations of the earth. But not fully being given it all in part we don't have clarity of everything and even when he comes at the start of the 40 days he's not giving them the understanding of everything he begins by giving them what 
the understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of God, plural, because they're the ones from the beginning of tribulation. So they're being given the mysteries. But they're also the ones at the end of tribulation, at the end of trumpets, who are coming back being part of the resurrection. And as the Lord is speaking to this other group, these guys are saying, why are you giving, why are you speaking them the understanding of the parable? And he says, look, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, which means the group from Luke who received the mysteries of the kingdom of God, plural, then were killed, beheaded, right? The, the John the Baptist type, the Moses types, some remained alive, but what happens? They got to go to the kingdom of God. Remember, they still get to go to the third heaven when their time is over. But then they're going to be part of the resurrection. And in the resurrection, here they are showing up again. And what do they do, brothers and sisters, in the resurrection? Okay. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 tells you, I saw the souls of those that were beheaded, like John the Baptist. They didn't receive the mark in their hands or in their foreheads. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, so everybody else, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So it's only this group who put their necks on the line, which is that group of disciple workers from Luke putting their necks on the line during seals. They're going to take part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, we all know we've covered it many times. Who is this group? It's the Smyrna group. It's this group that begins the 40 days with the Son of Man when he returns from the Gentile wedding. Tells it right here, verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. It's the Smyrna workers. And the Smyrna workers are the Luke disciples, as we've taught, shared many times. They're the ones who start with them from the 40 days. So if they're the ones taking part in the resurrection, when it's all over, when the Lord returns, and this is a prophetic picture of trumpets, and it starts with telling us at the end of trumpets, who are the ones receiving the mysteries now of the kingdom of heaven? How about the ones who received the mysteries of the kingdom of God? who are then resurrected, who are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Don't you think they should be the ones to know the king, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven if they're going to be reigning in it with Christ? It never dawned on me before. I had never caught this one before. I know it's a deep one. But of course it would be the ones from Luke. It even tells us it was the disciples. It's got to be the ones that were resurrected because if they're going to reign with Christ, they need to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, which is the millennial reign. But to the others, but to them, it is not given to know the mysteries. So even the 12 tribes, those that go out during the millennial reign, they're going to be what? The gates through which people enter to come and worship the Lord during the millennial reign. They're not going to know all the mysteries because they're not the ones reigning with Christ. They're the ones going out to serve during the time of the millennial reign to teach the ways of the Lord. We know them, of course, from the end of Matthew, just like we knew the others from the end of Mark. And the first group is from the end of Luke. You see, all power is given unto him in heaven and on earth. This is like at the seventh trumpet. When everything will be made known, he returns feet down. And he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Teaching. See, to teach all teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you and lo I'm with you always even until the end of the world because prophetically he is now returned he is feet down on the Mount of Olives there's no more preaching because he is here it is only them going out to teach of his ways he doesn't berate these people he doesn't have a meal they're not already eating a meal it's the Lord returning 
and it relates to the 12 tribes. So he's not giving them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He's giving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to the disciples who were resurrected. Pretty wild, right? Now watch this. This is why you only see this in Matthews. For whosoever has, to him shall be given. Who are the ones that had, brothers and sisters? The disciples from Luke. They were the ones given the, the abundance of mysteries, right? The mysteries, plural. So it can't be the ones from Mark who had a single mystery given to them. So whosoever has, to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him shall be taken even that which he has. See that? There was only one group who had the abundance. There's a group that was resurrected to rule and reign with them. Who are going to be given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And it would make sense that it's them because whoever has more will be given in abundance. And of course, they're the ones reigning with them. So they need the mysteries. You would assume they would have to need the mysteries if they're reigning with them during the millennial reign. Now check this out. Matthew 13, 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing, remember, it's, it touched on it in Luke a little bit. It said a little bit more in Mark. And now we're coming to the end of Matthew. Right. We're in we're in Matthew's portion. And it says, by hearing, you shall hear and shall not understand. OK, now it's being fulfilled by hearing. You shall hear and, and shall not understand and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are of dull of hearing and their eyes. They have closed lest at any time they should see and their eyes uh, with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart. And should be converted, and I should heal them. You see, why didn't it say this, the prophecy of Isaiah being fulfilled in Mark's? Why did it wait till Matthew's? Because the picture is trumpets, and specifically right to the end of trumpets. Matthew's portion is for Judah. They were blinded for our sakes till the end of seals, and during trumpets they're being revealed, and by the end, then everything is open to them. Listen to verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Again, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to the disciples. How do we know this? Check this out. I went, I remembered this phrase very clearly. Okay. Many have desired. Okay. Do you know where this comes from? Watch this. First Peter chapter one. Remember this? Look at this. First Peter chapter one. This is something we've covered a lot in uh, a few months back, right? Peter, an apostle of Christ. Listen to this. To the strangers, who are the strangers? The Gentiles. To the Gentiles, who are what? The elect, according to the foreknowledge. A group pre-selected from the foundation of the earth. To the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, begotten unto us right here verse 4 to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you so remember reserved in heaven for you what does this mean remember what i said to the end of seals i think i'm going to be able to prove to you that as we're already seeing here their time is to the end of seals and then not during trumpets. So where are they during the time of trumpets? They have their place reserved for them in heaven. They're part of the inheritance, incorruptible. They have their place reserved for them in heaven. Who are they? They're the ones who are kept, that Gentile group, 
who are kept by the Lord. See, as the watchman, the Lord is watching over them by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed when? In the end of days. A group reserved and will be revealed in the end of days who are kept by the power of God, who are, have a place through inheritance reserved in heaven, who are Gentiles. Wherein you rejoice, where you wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations. Didn't we see that? We saw that earlier, right? Who's the group now going through temptations? That's the is portion. Remember, we just covered that in Luke when we were in Luke's parable of the sower. We didn't see we didn't see uh, um uh, um affliction and uh and that other one. Okay, we're going to talk about it still. We didn't see that. We only saw temptations. The word in Luke is temptations. This is that same group because in the is, they're being ready to be revealed in the last days. But until the last days comes, even though we're greatly rejoicing in the Lord, we're still in heaviness through many temptations, through many full temptations in the is of this life that we're living. See, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. This is when he comes at the 40 days. Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Listen to this. Receiving the end of your faith. Remember that one? Do you know the only way you could receive the end of your faith is when you're in the presence of the Lord? When will the end of your faith come for this group who has a place reserved, who are going to be revealed in the last times, who are being kept by the Lord? It's when the Lord shows up for his 40 days. It'll be the end of their faith, even the, even the salvation of your souls, because they were bidden in his presence. You see, when there's... You see, light, we're filled with hope, right? When do you no longer have hope that it's all true, that you love the Lord, that, oh, you believe? When you, you've been in the presence of your hope. When you've been in the presence of your faith. How are you going to deny it after you've been in the presence of it? You see? Verse 10, of which salvation, listen to this, here it comes. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and diligently searched who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. What did Matthew say? You see, there was a group, what they, they, they desired to hear these things. The angels have desired, the prophets have desired. They diligently sought within their own writings and within the other prophets to understand these things. In the time of Christ, it was the is and his salvation and so forth. In the is to come, clearly defined by it being in the end of days in a group of people chosen who are Gentiles receiving the end of their faith. Because why? These things that the prophets have diligently sought for, these guys have been revealed. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, uh, which was in them, did signify by, by uh, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Who is this group? Wherefore, gird up your loins, uh, the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end. Who are the ones that have their loins girded about? To whom this conversation is all being put forward to? You guys already know who it is. 
Let your loins be girded about. Luke 12, 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. And when he cometh and knocketh, you may open unto him immediately. This is that group. It's the group of the 40 days when they will be in the presence of their salvation. When their faith will be ended because they will be in the presence of their faith. This is that group. And here it is being spoken about even in Matthew 13 to this group, but at the end saying even the prophets and others have desired to see these things which you now see. It's, it's to the same group of people. Now, look at this. Matthew 13, 21. Again, some receive, see, and some receive it with joy. Verse 21. Yet, Hath he no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation, there it is. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. You see, again, this is what I was showing you here, remember? You find it in matthew's parable of the sower you find it in mark's parable of the sower then you find it in matthew's discourse which is the seven years of trumpets you find it then after mark's parable of the sower in mark's discourse which is seals tribulation and you find it nowhere in luke it is absolutely unequivocally prophetic brothers and sisters it's not only an is for the lives in the is that we're living. It is prophetic words for the is to come. Look at verse 22. He also received seed. Uh, he also that receives seed, <coughs> excuse me, among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world. Remember how it started with the cares? Now, in trumpets, it's the care of this world. What's the purpose of a single care? Survival? You know, the, what, what's the care of the world during trumpets? Uh, when Satan comes, Messiah is cut off, Satan shows up, right? The pit is open, Antichrist comes back, all the wickedness that's there. There's like a single care at this time. Interesting, right? And uh, uh, care of this world, right? And we know that. When the pit is open and Satan has his, his turn and Antichrist is there and false prophet and all the chaos, right? It's going to be through lies and deception and deceit. They're going to have this one care at that time. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. It's all about the word. And he becometh unfruitful. Again, then some 60, some 30. And then we see uh, the enemy, the kingdom of heaven is likened. So this is, this is part of the point as well. You see, when it tell, told us here that these guys are being given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, this is another great understanding to be able to show exactly that even though we're given context of events during trumpets, it starts by addressing a group at the end of trumpets. And how do we know this? Again, we've covered this, but the evidence is that they're given mysteries of what? They're given mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. When is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven doesn't start till the end of trumpets. If this was really about the beginning of trumpets, and this is the disciple group there to say, no, the disciples are also working during trumpets, then why would they be given the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven at the beginning of trumpets when it's not yet the kingdom of heaven till the end of trumpets. When we know these guys aren't resurrected till the end of trumpets when it's the time of the beginning of the kingdom of heaven. So awesome. Amazing, amazing stuff, guys. Now, what do we know within this? Watch this. We saw that uh, Revelation chapter 2, right? We know that who it related to. 
within Revelation chapter 2. But the other part I wanted to cover was the prophecy of Isaiah. Okay, watch this. In the prophecy of Isaiah, again, like we said, it wasn't in Luke. It was building. It wasn't in Mark. It was building. Now for the end of trumpets, it's the fulfillment of the Jews' time, those that were blinded for our sakes. So what is this prophecy of Isaiah? Let's go to it. It's Isaiah chapter 6. So we come to Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Listen to what it says. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. A prophetic picture of the Lord. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see you indeed, see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make. You see, the Lord had to make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest, you see that same word, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and healed. This is something we've taught on in the past. This is directly also connected to, again, something that's at the beginning from Luke's, from Luke's gospel at the transfiguration or right after the transfiguration, which is a prophetic picture of him coming to start his 40 days, as I mentioned earlier. And what do we see right after it? When he weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over them. And if you had only known in this thy day the things that were for your peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for you knew not the time of, of thy visitation. You see, they're hid from their eyes from the beginning in the is to come. Because had it not been hid, they could have been saved. If all the Jews got saved at the beginning of seals, having recognized what was taking place, it would have been over. You see, they were blinded for our part, for our sakes. That's why they have to be made known at the end, right? So here they are being blinded. This is why I keep saying we know that there's a whole again thing that's going to happen, that that during the time of trumpets, that the Lord has to do something again as Messiah ben Joseph, as the as the Ephraim line, as the firstborn, as the bull who is through Joshua, Yeshua. As the high priest, we know that this has to happen. So let's keep going. Then it says, verse 11, Isaiah 6. Then said I, Lord, how long? How long do they have to be blinded for? Okay. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Now listen to this. We know that this happens at the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. We know that the cities will be waste at the beginning of the 14 years. But there's going to be still another waste that's coming, remember? We know there's going to be devastation. Remember what happens in Daniel chapter 12. When the pit is open at mid-trumpets, we know that it says, uh, da -da -da -da, verse 6, verse 6, you know, how long will these things go on, right? Into verse 7, Daniel 12, verse 7. How long will these things last? And he says to him that had his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swore by him that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. So one, two, and a half. There's no end in between, right? So one, two, and a half years. So two and a half of the final three and a half years of trumpets. So from about 10 and a half years to 13 years, and then, of course, the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives for the final 14th year and destroys all the enemies and so forth. But listen to what it says. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So what are we seeing? A scattering of the people. Everybody, the, all the people that were brought back at the beginning, at the very end of seals, and into trumpets and the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. This is Matthew's portion of trumpets. This is the, the mid-trumpets portion 
and they're all scattered. They fly away on the wings of an eagle. Which means this scattering takes place until what? Until the end of the 13th year. Which is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is why it says, till all these things be finished. This is the same from Revelation chapter 10. As soon as the, the lips and the, the starts to sound, the seventh trumpet, which is the, the beginning of the final year of tribulation, the 14th year, the mystery of God shall be finished. So here is that scattering, which means what we're seeing here in Isaiah isn't just the scattering that takes place at the beginning. It's the scattering that goes through right to the end of the, the, of the 13th year of trumpets, of, of tribulation. Listen to what it says. And how can we prove this? Listen to what it says in the last verse of Isaiah 6.13. But yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return. And it shall be eaten, which means kindled, consumed by fire. As the teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them. Uh, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the sustenance thereof. Listen to what it says. Verse 13. But yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, as we saw from when they're being scattered for the last two and a half years of tribulation, what does that bring you to? The end of the second woe. What is the end of the second woe? It's the end of the sixth trumpet. The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are the three woes. So when we get to the end of the sixth woe, it's the end of 13 years of tribulation. It's the end of the two and a half years that Satan had when he was cast down and the pit was open to scatter them. Which means to Isaiah, it's telling us that the land was scattered to the end of that 13th year. And then what? A tenth would be left. Well, look at what verse 13 says of Revelation 11. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell in the earthquake and were slain of men 7,000 uh, and the rest of the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Bam. It's over. 13 years of tribulation, the two and a half years from mid trumpets of Satan's reign of two and a half years has come to an end. And what happens as soon as the seventh trumpet sounds? The Lord has returned feet down. Revelation 10 says the mystery of God will be over. It is finished. The world will now know that the Lord has returned feet down, which is why the 12 at this point are going out. You see, the Lord comes and what's going to happen? There's going to be the resurrection of those who put their necks on the line. It brings us to, whoops, it brings us from this in Isaiah of what we were showing. So we could see where it starts. Right. They they were hidden. It was hidden from their eyes. We know that this happened when Christ came. But what was what is shall be. And this is how it's going to begin in the 40 days. How long it'll be to the end of the 13th year of trumpets. Right. With a break in between. And then they're going to be moved far away, forsaken from the land. And then. But yet in it shall a tenth shall be a tenth and it shall return. Which means to the end of trumpets. OK. It's it, it, it's all there, guys. It's all saying the same language, the prophetic language to the end. There's their portion. Now, when we see this and we go into Hosea, <laughs> excuse me. Look at what it says now here in Hosea. Why is Jose important to us? Well, again, when we go to our chapters to years, we know that Hosea, which is to the Gentiles, has 14 chapters. Zechariah to Judah has 14 chapters. And so if we come to Hosea chapter 6, we're going to see when we talk about these chapters and these 
words within the chapter. Sometimes the entire chapter is prophetic to the end. Sometimes it's verses within these chapters that are prophetic to these years. Sometimes it could be early in the year. Sometimes it could be in the midst of the year. Sometimes the word being spoken is towards the end of that year. And so here we are looking now as we've gone from Luke in the pre, Mark in the mid, Matthew in the post. Let's see now this connection to why I'm showing that Luke's group of the remnant workers are only here till the end of seals, okay? And will be gone during trumpets. That's why they had that place reserved for them in heaven. And then we see them return in Matthew to receive the understanding, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, because that's what they're going to be reigning in. So when we come to chapter 6 of Hosea, which is a prophetic picture towards the end, that very end portion of the sixth year of seals, <clears throat> Let's go see what Hosea says. Now, even before I get there, why, why Hosea? How do we know Hosea is to the Gentiles? Well, for that, we go to Romans chapter 9. For those that didn't understand this, in Romans chapter 9, in, starting in verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels, which are the people, of mercy, listen to this, which he had before prepared unto glory. Hello. Which he had afore prepared. Which he had what? Prepared in advance. Ordained in advance. Sound familiar? A group who he had ordained and prepared in advance unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jew only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Osi. Who is Osi? Hosea. So as he says in the book of Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. You see, his Gentile bride and the Gentiles from among them. A group prepared beforehand unto glory. So awesome. Verse 26. And it shall come to pass that in that place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Okay? Hosea's to the Gentiles. And that's why it starts in chapter 1. The beginning. The word of the Lord. So the father says to Hosea, uh, said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredom and of children and children of whoredoms. Whoredoms is just, a, is adultery, but it's another figurative way of saying Gentiles. Okay? So there you even see right from Romans, and here it is in the beginning, go get your wife, your Gentile bride. So when we come to chapter 6, we're seeing this prophetic picture as the end of the sixth year of seals. What do we know is happening at the end of the sixth year of seals? Let's go to chapter 6 of Revelation. At the end of the sixth year of seals, they see the Lord coming. They're saying to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. This is the Lord coming, as you know, on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of six years of seals. And we know that this timing of Hosea chapter six is this time when they're seeing it come. So who is this conversation to? Listen to what it says. Listen closely because we're going to take this forward. Verse one, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. We know a group he's going to heal, right? He hath smitten, right? Some of us will die, right? Some of us will have taken beatings, and he will bind us up. So there's a group saying, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, he will heal us. He has smitten us, but he will bind us up. 
What do you think is going to be happening to the remnant workers during the time of seals? Some are going to die. Some are going to be beaten. Some will survive. That's why Smyrna says, some of you they shall cause to be put to death. We know it's not all. Now listen to what it says in verse 2. After two days. What does that mean? So here we are, a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. The time of the remnant workers of seals is coming to an end. He's, they're going to return to them. He's going to bind them and so forth. And then what does it say about them? After two days, which is what? The 2,000 years. So when the, when the end of tribulation comes and the millennial reign is about to start, who is he going to revive? This group here. The rem they, these are actually the remnant workers. You know, I've looked at this in the past as being the even the people going through the tribulation of seals, right? The, the church coming to an end. You know, you could see that there's a portion of that, but not really. I mean, you, you could see it in a typology, just like the John the Baptist type are those who die along the way. And the Elijah, who John is also a type of, jo Elijah never died, but went up in a whirlwind. So it's a picture of those during seals who are coming to Christ and those who will die for their faith and those who will be taken alive, not tasting of death when they go to paradise. But this isn't that. This is more specifically as those workers who represent more specifically the, the Moses John types and the Elijah types of some of those Smyrna workers of which some will die and some will make it through to the end of seals alive. Those are the remnant workers. Those who we see are part of the resurrection that, that won't be hurt by the second death. That disciple group, the Luke group, the, the ones from Matthew that are coming back, that are going to be given the understanding, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, because they're going to be reigning in it. This is that group here too. And how can we prove it? Because after two days, listen to what he says. He's going to revive us. He's going to restore them back to life. Is the Lord going to restore everybody back to life for the millennial reign? No. He's only restoring those who put their necks on the line. He's only restoring that remnant group from Luke. Their reward is to rule and reign with them for the thousand years. And we showed that, <clears throat> but I'm going to show you how in, in Revelation 21, after the millennial, um, um, when the millennial reigns over and New Jerusalem is coming down, we've shared this many times. Look at who the 12 tribes are. The 12, remember? They're the gates. They're the ones during the millennial reign who, who were leading people in through the gates to come and worship the Lord. Who were the apostles? They were the ones during the time of seals while the other remnant disciples were working as well. These guys were laying the spiritual foundation and represent the foundations of New Jerusalem. They work during seals. And then you see that the walls, the 144,000 represent the walls during the time of trumpets that are getting rebuilt. And what does it say? The measure thereof, 144. It's a prophetic typology of the walls. So the foundations are laid first during seals. In the, in the physical, but also the spiritual. Then you have the wall that's during trumpets as the 144, when they're going to rebuild the wall and the city and the streets and the temple. And then during the millennial reign, you have the 12 tribes that are the 12 gates through which everybody's going to enter during the millennial reign. And when the millennial reign and everything's over, New Jerusalem comes down, it's represented by the apostles, the 144, and the 12 tribes. Well, there's a problem. Because what about the disciples from Luke who were with the Lord for 40 days, worked during seals, put their necks on the line? It was a special group to the Lord. Well, we know who they are. And they were the ones we were just talking about that we shared earlier. They're the ones who are going to be resurrected, put their necks on the line. They're going to reign with Christ. They're going to, the second death will not hurt them. And they're going to reign with them for a thousand years. There's only one group this represents, and that's the Smyrna group of workers. So when we see this again, when we go back into, where was I? Oh, in uh, Hosea chapter 6, 
Listen to what it says next. So after two days, he will revive us, okay? So he's going to restore them back to life, bring them back from the dead. That's why we saw them at the end of Trump. It's in Matthew receiving the understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this. In the third day, okay, at the end of the millennial reign, listen to this. He will raise us up. Why is he going to raise us up? Why is he going to raise us up? Well, remember what it said? They won't, have, they won't be hurt by the second death. What's the second death? It's at the judgment of the, at the end of the millennial reign. So these guys are resurrected for the millennial reign. And then at the end of the millennial reign, which is the third day, these guys don't have to worry about it. The second death has no, no issue on them. They're going to be raised up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going. Now listen to this. Here's where it gets leading in to Joel now. Um, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain. Listen to this. As the latter and former rain unto the earth. I want you to remember that. And he shall come unto us as the latter and former rain. This is going to be a big deal to remember. All right? So now let's take this in and let's go briefly into the book of Joel and really get into focusing on a specific part. Okay? For those of you that don't know, here's the video that I did. One. There we go. It's called Joel in the Is to Come. It was October 17, 2021, a little over two years ago, okay? In it was the revelation of Joel chapter 1 being in the time of the 40 days of the Son of Man to the, to the 50th day, okay, of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Joel chapter 2 is a prophetic picture to the end of seals, and Joel chapter 3 is a prophetic picture to the end of trumpets. So it's the Luke, Mark, Matthew at his comings, okay? Not at the pre-trib, but at his comings into the 50th day with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and then to the end of the sixth year, right? When he comes uh, at the end of the sixth year on heavenly Mount Zion, and when he returns feet down at the end of six years, at the start of uh, the 14th year of trumpets, okay? So we revealed, this is what I was telling you earlier, that uh, Ivan had made that comment on it, right? It's like a, a chapters to years, but of his comings of 40 days, end of seals, and end of trumpets. So let's review this quickly in Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3. And then we're really going to focus in on something in Joel chapter 2 that I think is going to blow your minds. So we see in Joel chapter 1, um, let's start in verse 5. Awake, you, drunk, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. What is the new wine, brothers and sisters? For those of you that don't know, it's Acts chapter 2, at the coming of the Holy Ghost, at Pentecost, at true Pentecost, when they were accused of being full and being drunken on new wine. You see that? Sweet wine. New wine, sweet wine, new wine. Joel is this prophetic picture of the beginning, okay? Not, not directly related to um, uh, um, uh, the, all of this time of the 40 days, but kind of towards the very end and when the Holy Ghost anoints, okay? Listen to what it says. Uh, da -da -da -da. Verse 5, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. Verse 6. For a nation shall come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion. He, ha he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Who do we know is a nation coming up as a lion against them? When does it happen? It happens at the beginning of the 14 years. When the 50 days are over, they're going to be attacked by Syria. And Syria, who comes from the north, is the lion who comes up from his thicket in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7. 
So the lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Okay? Syria is the one coming who is going to be the one compassing them about, as you read in Luke chapter 21 in Luke's discourse. This is why when the Son of Man is coming for 40 days, he's warning about them being compassed about. When they see them get compassed about, they are to flee to the mountains. And we know this is what the Lord is doing during his 40 days. He's with the disciples, but he is also warning of the coming surrounding and destruction of Jerusalem that will happen right after the 50th day anointing at new wine by the Holy Ghost. And it's the lion who's coming, who is Syria, coming from the north. So this is why we're saying this is during the 40 days, the timing of the Son of Man, who's warning that Syria is coming. And he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Verse 10, the field is wasted, the land mourns, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languishes. We've seen this. Um, even all the trees of the field are withered because of the joy is withered away from the sons of men. Uh, verse 14, sanctify, call ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord, alas, for the day for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And of course, we know he lays it desolate. And what do we know about it? Even in uh, Jeremiah 4, as we continue down, and it says, in an hour, you know, it's just destroyed. My curtains are broke, are, are barren. And it says that uh, even though he's going to destroy it, it's not going to be completely destroyed that nobody can ever come back. Right, because we know he will be bringing them back, but it's destroyed so that they're all removed from the land. And of course, we know it's because the land must rest for seven years before the temple can be rebuilt. So that's Joel chapter one. We understand it, especially from the, the conversation of the new wine. Now, Joel chapter two. In Joel chapter two, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Wasn't that what happens also at the Feast of Trumpets? That they blow the trumpet? And where are they blowing it? And a sound and sound the alarm in my holy mountain? Well, we saw at the end of the sixth at the end of the sixth seal, the Lord is coming down. Everybody's freaking out, right? They're all panicking. And his coming. They the, the trumpet's gonna sound. He's gonna be what? He's gonna be in his holy mountain. How do we know this? We can go to Zechariah chapter 8, which is the beginning, the first year of trumpets, and it tells us that he's here on his mountain. It's the holy mountain of the Lord. So this is the eighth year of tribulation or the beginning now of trumpets, of the, of the trumpet judgments, the seven years of trumpets. And they're going to start to rebuild. They're going to be rebuilding the temple on the foundation that was laid in the physical during the time of seals. Okay, so we know that he's come. Um, where am I? So we know that he's come. Oh, Joel, there we go. So we know that he's come on heavenly Mount Zion. This is what so many people have missed. They, they don't understand that the end of the sixth seal is actually him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. That's why you see it in Revelation 14. The 144,000 are on Mount Zion with the Lamb. In, in Zechariah chapter 8, it's the beginning of the trumpets. And he says, why, why didn't all the buildings start before this? I think by verse 9 or 10. And it says, because I set every man against his neighbor. Well, that's, that's the red horse rider. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And so here we are at the end of the sixth year of seals. And he's coming on his holy mountain. We know that he's coming at trumpets. That's why Mark's discourse tells us the day and hour no one knows. Let, let's go have a look at that, and let's show this connection. Because in Luke's discourse, which we showed, okay, 
this, as we said before, this is the abomination in the portable temple covered in flesh, like Moses is. That's why it's also the timing is a prophetic picture of the time of Moses, as John is also a prophetic picture, John the Baptist as the Moses type. They saw that the, the teacher of righteousness was a typology of that, but John wasn't yet there, right? And so look at what we're seeing. We're seeing this typology. This is the mark of the beast time. They got to flee to the, to the wilderness. Then what do we see? Here comes the son of man. This is him coming. This right here. Listen to what it says in verse 24 of Mark 13. But in those days, after what? That tribulation. Matthew says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Mark says after that tribulation, which means there was a specific tribulation before the end of all tribulation. This is to the end of the sixth year of seals. This here is when you see him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, at the, the end of the sixth year of trumpets. In Revelation chapter 6, when he's coming in the clouds, and listen to what it says. But of that day and hour, knows no man. Okay? No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. What day is this, guys? It's the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour no one knows. What, what did it say in, in uh, Joel chapter 2? It said, sound the trumpet. When, when is it going to happen? On the day and hour, no one knows the Feast of Trumpets. And look at what it says. Here's the workers, remember? Remember the workers that work during seals? This is to the end of the sixth year of seals. This is that same prophetic group that we saw in Hosea chapter 6. And what does it say? Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. These are the disciple servants from Luke. Um, and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Listen to the wording. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or the morning. Do you see what it says? Does it tell you you can't know the day? Does it say that these servants who were given authority as the disciples from Luke who worked during seals, did it say that they wouldn't know the day? No. Over here, nobody would know. The, the people in general wouldn't know the day and hour. But what about the remnant workers, the servants who were working seals, who were with them for 40 days, who opened the understanding, who were being revealed before it all began, that the day and hour to the end of six years of seals, because it starts the 14 years on Feast of Trumpets, six years will end when he comes at the time of Feast of Trumpets, which means this group of servants will know the day. But nobody knows exactly the hour when he's coming. Do you see any condemnation against this group? You see no condemnation. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and what I say to you, I say unto all, watch. Who are they? They're the watchmen who are watching, right? Keeping awake, being vigilant. Knowing that he's coming after six years on the day and hour no one knows, but they're to be extra on guard because they don't know exactly whether it's day one or day two because it's the day and hour no one knows, and so they don't know the exact hour of it. Do you know when you go to Matthews in Matthew 24? Do you know that this group receives a berating? Isn't that crazy? We saw that in that in the in Matthew in the resurrection story that he unbraided that group, which is a picture of the 144. We saw in in Mark's um, uh, um, parable of the sower, which is that picture, like I said, the the end of seals, and then it still relates to the things of seals, but it's given this conversation of a group with the twelve, who is the picture of the 144. And he gives them a tongue lashing because they didn't understand the parables. And this same group is the group working during trumpets. That when the Lord comes, 
at the end of 13 years, immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is the six years of trumpets, it was the 144 working trumpets. And there's what? There's going to be a great sound of a trumpet. What ends up happening to this group? It's also on the day and hour no one knows. But what happens to this group? Listen to what he says. Watch ye therefore, for you not know not what hour the Lord comes. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known uh, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken in. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now remember, these guys weren't the ones being given all the revelation, right, of the mysteries. They weren't given all the revelation of the mysteries. So they're not fully aware, always to be watching. Or, or they know to watch, but it seems like there's going to be some disappointment within some of them. Because here comes the end of trumpets when he's going to return feet down. And look at what he says. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household and giveth them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall, shall, shall so find doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and begins to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkard, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not, and an hour when he is least aware. You see, there's always with the 144 there's always a reprimand and aren't you aware and you had better not be doing this and there he says it but and if there is an evil servant in them who turns on the other servants well we know that's precisely what's going to happen in trumpets that's related to judas in this thing happening again with christ all of these th three times there's a warning and a reprimand and a hey aren't you guys aware of this always to the hundred and forty four thousand. so again in mark 13 we see this group here they are we know it's the feast of trumpets the day and hour no one knows they're not really going to be aware of what hour it's going to be, so they're going to be watching like crazy, fully aware, having worked, having served, having had the authority that was given to them in the mysteries, and it's at trumpet's time. So we see here in Mark 13 that their work is coming to an end. <clears throat> well, remember Mark 13? is to the end of the sixth year seals. We saw Hosea chapter 6, which is the end of the sixth year of seals, and a group being revived, and this group saying they're going to be you know, brought back to life, which we know are those who are part of the resurrection for the millennial reign. And then he tells them, and then Christ is coming, right? His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain, and the former rain. I want you to remember this, okay? Both of those are related to the end of six years of seals. And I'm showing you here, him coming on heavenly Mount Zion is directly connected to the end of the sixth year of seals. So let's have a look. Let's see. Uh, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Hmm. Let's go have a look at something. Let's go have a look. See if we can see this wording somewhere. The stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You've got the same wording. To the end of six years of seals. And him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. It's the end of the sixth year of seals. 
Okay? Watch this. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. You see, because she was already in the third heaven. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach to the heathen, um, that the heathen should rule over them. Verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Uh, to, to, to verse 19, part way through, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far from, uh, far off from you, the northern army. Remember, it's the battle at the end, right? At the end of the sixth seal, the Ezekiel 39 war. So he's going to remove from them the northern army. We know this connection, right? To the to the to the beast type and those with the beast and and uh, uh, being one of the beasts, right? With the, from the north being Syria. Um, verse twenty one: Fear not, O land; be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. You see, remember what happened when he removed them from the land. He's removing them from the land because he's having pity on his land. We see this in Zechariah. Chapter 1. So at the beginning of the tribulation, the beginning of the 14 years, we see in verse 12, um, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years? You see, he's jealous for Jerusalem and for Judah, for the land, because the land is his. So the land had to rest for seven years. And you might say, well, wait a second. If he's coming back after six, that's not seven years. There's still one more year. That's right. And in that one year, the 144,000 after the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of the sixth year, the 144,000 are sealed. The great multitude comes in about halfway through that seventh year. Then he makes in, in the seventh seal, he makes a covenant with all people. And when he makes that covenant, it's in that final five or so months of that seventh year of seals. And then, bang, when the seventh year is over and trumpets begins, that's why in Zechariah chapter 8, the Lord is there now on Mount Zion. It's established. It's in the clouds above the mountains, however that's going to look. And they're going to start to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple on the foundation that was built during the time of seals, which is when the apostles were also there building the spiritual foundation of the Lord while an actual foundation was being built in Jerusalem for the temple to be built on. But all the people weren't gathered back. The land is at rest. So here we go. Let's see what it says next. Uh, here it comes. But we're not going to break it all down yet. I want you to see this connection. Before we really go into this incredible piece of revelation, Joel 2.23, the end of the sixth year of seals. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Remember what I said? Remember what I was saying earlier when I went to um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he's saying this is the third time I'm come? You know, you're the parents, Judah. So you had to lay up for the children who were going first. Okay. So this is relating to the church. You can say even to the house of Israel, the Gentiles that are grafted in, the time of the great multitude rapture. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you, listen to this, I'll bet you you have never seen this in your life. I didn't. Because you know what? A program like ESORD, I, I always say is the multiplier of revelation, is the multiplier of understanding. You can use just regular KJV or you use the KJV plus with this eSword program. And look at this. You see, we always go through. We get these definitions of the words. We find out where they are, what their meanings are. Well, we don't do it all the time. There's, it's connected to every word. So we don't always go into every word. Sometimes it just doesn't cross your mind. It's almost like the spirit is saving it 
for a certain time. Just maybe. Well, today was that certain time. Listen to what it says. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. Okay? He has given you the former rain moderately. What does the word moderately mean? Okay? To an extent. He has given you this understanding. He has given you this, this revelation. He has given you the mysteries to an extent. But it's much more than that. Hold on to your horses. We're not going there yet. Listen to this. Now, when we see a comma and, that means they're separate. Right? They're separate, but they're, they're together. And he will cause to come down. You see? To descend. Okay? And he will cause to come down, which is the Lord coming down. See? And he will cause to come down for you the rain. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The former rain and the latter rain. Um, when did we see Hosea tell us the former rain and the latter rain were coming? At the end of the sixth year of seals. This is the prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. And what did he say? And he shall come unto us. See? And he shall come unto us. Who is he? The rain. Christ. As the latter and former rain. So he's coming to us as the latter and the former rain. But I wanted you to notice something. That when I heard this guy teaching on this. Telling me what the words were. I lost my mind. And we're going to get to it. Because look at what he said first. Listen to who he said it came from. And rejoice in the Lord your God. Okay? Remember, during seals, it's the children of Zion being brought in. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For he, the Lord God, hath given you the former rain moderately. Comma and he the Lord Father God, will cause to come down, okay? The former rain moderately didn't come down. The former rain moderately is something else. Comma, and the Lord God will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and latter rain. Who is the former rain and latter rain? And how is it possible then that it's different from the former rain moderately? We saw in I we saw in Hosea 6 that Christ is the former rain and the latter rain. So who or what then is the former rain moderately? And look at this. The floors shall be full of wheat and the fats uh, uh, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Of course, the wheat's the full of wheat, right? It's the great multitude rapture, the, the main wheat harvest, the spring wheat. And why the wine? Because as you know, the end of the sixth year of seals is when the wine is ready. When is spring wheat ready? You guys know this. Spring wheat is planted in the spring. It's the new wheat, right? So it wasn't part of the pre-trib. It's the mid-trib we always talk about. The spring wheat is harvested in the fall. But remember, it can't be used until the second day of Passover the following year, which is why the actual physical multitude rapture takes place in the midst of the, sec the seventh year of seals. They don't know when it's going to happen exactly. But it's about halfway through the year. But when is the wheat harvested? When is it full? In the fall. At the time of trumpets. When what? When the wine is also ready. And what does he say? I'll restore unto the years that all these things had taken. Um... Uh, verse 27, 
and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Okay, now let's go a little bit further. Okay, the last verse, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call, listen to this. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on my name. Or sorry, who, <laughs> give me a second. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord had said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Who are the remnant? The left behind, the survivors. Those who survived during seals. The great multitude rapture. Who are they? Remember what I told you earlier? There is a difference in rewards. There isn't everybody going to the same place. There's the third heaven in the kingdom of God. There is the paradise in the kingdom of God. There are different rewards once you're there. What do the church people do? By the end of seals, and even in the midst, all they have to do is what? Call on the name of the Lord. You see, what happens is when people only understand seven years and they think it's like the two witnesses are coming first, it's like the end of seals. They think the two witnesses are coming first. All you got to do is call on the name of the Lord and you're saved. This is why there's so much debate and argument over these things. Because for a group, that is how it is. For another group, it's a dedication in the Lord, forsaking the things of the earth, living for Christ. Walking in Christ throughout their daily walk, being repentant, diligently seeking him. But for the 90% of the church out there, they're just caught up living their things in life. And they believe in Christ. And in that kind of walk, many people get caught up in the things of this world and get pulled away. But others call on the Lord. Like the thief on the cross, he called on the Lord in his final moments. This is a picture of the end of seals, the Gentile age. The church age is over. It is over at this point. This is the end of calling on the Lord. And this is what the church does. They call on the name of the Lord and ah, I'm, I'm saved, I'm, I'm good. But you see, what happens is you've got the rest of your life to live. And along the way in the rest of your life, if you're not seeking the, the Lord in his word, you can fall away. The things of this world can snag you and, and pull you away. It happens every day. But why is this the final call? Because it's the end of the Gentile age. You're not going to have the rest of your life to live out. To see if you're going to be able to survive or live your life and see which way it goes as you believe in Jesus. And maybe you fall, maybe you get stronger. No. This is the final call. This is the end. And anybody who calls on the name of the Lord at that point will be saved and will be delivered to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. You would think everybody at that point would call, wouldn't you? But that won't be the case. That won't be the case. Do you know what happened to this group during seals? Those, many, many died in earthquakes and in a bunch of different things and died because they refused to do different things, take the mark and so forth. But this group, remember when the tribulation starts? It says mother against father, daughter against uh, mother, father against son. And what happened? Jesus told us that you think I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring division. That's what's going on during seals. But who is the one who must prepare the way? Who's the one who prepares the way during the time of seals? The John the Baptist type. The Moses John the Baptist type. I don't believe he's going to be alone, just like John the Baptist wasn't alone. And in the end of days, this is not going to be a John the Baptist guy alone. It's going to be with a group of people who have understood, who have been prepared in the revelation. Because we're in a different age. We're in a different time. We've got 8 billion or so people on the earth. 
not what few million back in those days. It's a completely different time. So it's going to be a much larger group who will have been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God who are responsible in preparing a group who will be responsible in bringing fathers and sons, mothers and daughters back together who are John types and Moses John types and Elijah types, some dying, some not, that are the remnant workers, the disciples. Remember this in Mark Remember Mark the resurrect uh, the the going to the crucifixion story it's a it's a prophetic picture in Mark as the end of seals and what did we see here we've spoken about this a number of times over the years in Mark chapter 14 uh verse 15 so they go and prepare the place right for the for the uh, uh Passover meal and what does he say in verse 15 he says and I will show you a large upper room this word room this upper room is only used twice. It's used in Luke's for those going pre-trip to the kingdom, to the third heaven in the kingdom of God. And it's used in Mark's for those who have been prepared, who are going to paradise. Who is the group in the kingdom of God who is prepared, furnished, and prepared? Who is responsible for this preparing at the end of seals? The John the Baptist types. John the Baptist is the typology, as the Moses typology. Both of them dying, not being able to take them over, right? And the Elijah, who John is the type of, is the one who is the alive type going. Because some of Smyrna die, not all of them. Some of them have put on their necks on the line, but they were all willing to put their necks on the line. So there's a group those who work during seals who are the ones responsible for preparing this way. And this is the second room. This is the one for paradise that he prepared, that this group represents as bringing the mothers and daughters and fathers and sons back together. We showed why it starts like that in Luke. When you go to Mark's discourse, it talks about mother against father, uh, um, father against son, mother against daughter, and so forth. But when you get to Matthew's discourse, there is no father against son, mother against daughter. That was only for the time of seals. And it was John and the John types, those with them, those in that category of workers, who were the ones that prepared the way and brought them back together for the great multitude rapture. This is what we're seeing. This is the exact conversation that's taking place that's related to this group. That's related to this group here in Joel chapter 2 as the end of the sixth seal. And there's a mystery of, of the ones who brought the children of Zion in, who are the ones who prepared the way, and it's the Father who hath given us the former reign moderately, which means something was given connected to christ that was that was a former reign but clearly not christ of course but it was given moderately meaning not in full and when christ comes down who is the reign who is the former reign and latter reign he is the fullness of this picture and this is of course christ coming on heavenly mount zion at the end of the sixth year of seals they will all cry out. Those who have come back, father and son, reunited back together in Christ. And as I've said, I believe in this greatest revival in human history that's going to happen during seals in the midst of the worst time in, in, in human history up to that point. That this greatest revival, I believe, is going to be over 1.2 billion people, of which... A number, hundreds of millions will have died, but the majority will have made it alive and are part of this group that shall call on the name of the Lord when they see this coming, when they see the Lord there. 
And it's the John the Baptist Moses groups that prepared the way and the Elijah types as John who survived it who will have been the ones who prepared the way. Don't you worry. We're coming back to John, uh, Joel chapter 2 in a moment. Now, in Joel chapter 3, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. You see, when is he going to do this? When he returns feet down in the final year, he's going to return and bring back the captivity of them. And I will gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them for my people and for my heritage, Israel, um, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Because you have taken my gold and my silver. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, listen to this. Here it comes. Verse 9, Joel 3. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Look at this. This word for war is the Hebrew word 4421. The question is, we know that there are two wars. There's the end of seals war and there's the end of trumpets war. The final year, right? In, in the Lord's judgment when he brings all nations. So which war is this? Well, gratefully through scripture and revelation, we can understand that this war, the Hebrew word 4421, is the one from Zechariah 14. And listen to what it says. From the day of the Lord, uh, verse 2. For I will gather all nations. You see? The same conversation. Zechariah 14 chapters, the beginning of the final 14th year, after the two and a half years Satan had. Here's the final 14th year. The Lord has returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. There it is, 4421. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall, uh, shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Listen to this. As when he fought in the day of battle. Which means there must have been another time when he fought in the day of battle, which is a different word, 7128. This is the battle that he fought at the end of the sixth year of seals in the Ezekiel 39 war. This is the battle in the final year of trumpets in the 14th year of tribulation when he returns feet down so when we're seeing it's the same word right here from joel chapter 3 when he gathers all nations this is the final 14th year just like we know joel chapter 3 is all about because it's the final post-trib you see what do we know happened at the end of the ezekiel 39 war they will beat their plowshares, right? They will burn the weapons for seven years. In Ezekiel 39, why are they burning weapons for seven years? Because you got the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets, that's seven years. So what happens after those seven years? There's going to be another battle. So they 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 made them into, into pruning hooks, and they made them into uh, uh, plowshares. And they were burning some of the weapons and they were doing this for seven years. Until what? The seven years are over, the seventh year of seals and the sixth of trumpets. And now it's the battle when the Lord gathers all nations, just like he, Joel chapter three said. And what then would they be doing at this battle? Well, check it out. Check it out. Look what ends up happening. Okay. Proclaim ye the war. So now the Lord has returned feet down. Those seven years from the last battle have taken place. There, there, there's seven years of burning the weapons and turning them into plowshares and everything else. So now look what happens. Verse 10, beat your plowshares into swords. Now those plowshares that they have for seven years, they're now turning them into swords. And your pruning hooks into spears. And let the weak say, I am strong. Verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full and the vats overflow. What's going on here, brothers and sisters? You got it. 
It's the time of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. It's the final 14th year. It is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. It's Revelation 19, the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. And then what does he say as he's now brought them back? Listen to what it says. Uh, let's start in verse Joel 3, 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine. Well, how about that? Isn't new wine the end of 13 or the start of 14 and even the end of the, the end of 14th year? The end of the 14th year is on 29th of Elul, which is true new wine. And the hills shall flow with milk. Listen to this. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Sound familiar? Ezekiel chapter 47. What is Ezekiel chapter 47 in the chapters to years? It's the end of the 14th year in the prophetic picture. And what happens? Water goes flow, flow forth from the house of the Lord. You see, Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3 are in order, brothers and sisters. <laughs> so now, what is this incredible, mind-blowing revelation from Joel chapter 2? Well, let me remind you guys. Let me remind you guys of what we know. We know that the original Christians... In the very, very early, they weren't called Christians. They were called 14ers, right? We talked about this. They were called quadradecimin. They were called 14ers. And what were they? They were the Nastrum, which is just another way of saying Nazarene, okay? Nastrum, Hebrew for Nazarenes. They were Nazarenes. Christ was of Nazareth. And why were they called 14ers? <laughs> Many of you guys know this, but I'm, I'm putting this out there for a purpose. Okay? We know this, but we didn't know this when I first started calling us 14ers. Look at this video here. Here's a video Look, cotton sucks. from over four years ago, just to give you an example. This is June 10th, 2019, about four and a half years ago, when I was calling us 14ers. And if I played the video, you would see, you would hear me say, hello, 14ers. Prior to that, I was occasionally talking about it. And then I started calling us 14ers. I had no idea, for those that are newer, I had no idea that there was a group called Quadradecimin that in English means 14thers or 14ers. I had no idea there was a very early Christian group who were the true believers in Christ, diligently seeking him, following after him. I had no idea. I was doing it because of the 14 years, as you guys know. Right? The, the ministry is the revelation of the 14 years and, of course, who the Gospels are speaking to. So I just used this, this word that sounded cute to say, hello, 14ers, because we are a group that understand the revelation and the truth that was revealed in the Gospels that it's 14 years. But the original early ones were also called 14ers, but they were called 14thers or 14ers because of the 14th day. Okay? They were called 14ers because of, where is it? Because of the 14th day. Okay? And what 14th day? The 14th day of Passover. So what had happened is the church through Rome wanted to change it to celebrating Easter on the first Sunday of the week. But the true Christians, the true 14ers, before the word Christian was around, these guys were being called 14thers because they were sticking to the true date of Passover, which is the 14th day of the first month. So they were the 14th day, 
We are the 14 years. And you guys know this. In prophecy, there is the principle of day to year. The day to year principle or year for a day principle, listen to this, is a method of interpretation of Bible what? Was? No. Is? No. Prophecy is to come. So just as we have shown over the years, how in Luke chapter 9, we see the picture of the, the uh, um, uh, uh, transfiguration and how his says about an eighth day. The day is a prophetic picture of the first seven years of seals coming to an end. There's only 50 days left. So it's not quite the eighth year. It's about an eighth day. It's almost the eighth year. Okay, we know it has a prophetic picture of the eighth day when he comes after the wedding as well. In, only in Luke it does that. But in the year, in the days as years, this is the prophetic picture. And when we go to Mark's, what do we see in Mark's transfiguration story? It says, after six days. What is the prophetic picture of after six days? It is now the start of the eighth in the big picture, or it is from one to the six years coming to an end. And what do we know? At the end of six years, the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion, as we've been showing. When we go to Matthew's transfiguration story, we see also after six days. What is it in the prophetic? It is after six years of trumpets. And the Lord is returning as we have just covered feet down on the Mount of Olives in that final war. So in the is, they were days. And in the prophetic, they are years. And in the prophetic, I was calling us 14ers because of the 14 years, which in the is, they were 14thers because of days. Do you understand the absolute bananas, quote unquote, big quote unquote, coincidence? That is not a coincidence, brothers and sisters, that we then so happen to be the ministry being given and being led in the revelations of the mysteries hidden since the foundation of the earth. The very things that that the disciples, that, that, the, uh, that the prophets, that the angels have tried to understand. We're, we're that group chosen. We're that group. It's undoubtable. It, it's, all you have to do is look through the past six years and change. Revelation after revelation after revelation, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they don't skip a beat. They all support each other. Hundreds and hundreds of times. So let's, let's read a little bit about this Essenes group. Because remember, the Essenes is this group from the Dead Sea Scrolls. They had a group of people which had the teacher of righteousness who had these prophetic revelations through understanding from the was believing in the prophetic end of days because they were an apocalyptic group to the is. So in a way, you can say they were from a was into an is. But was it really the prophetic end of days? No, it was not. Which is why we know and why there are writings that told us there is a group in the end of days that is in the final generation being prepared. And what do we see in the scriptures? Exactly that. We just saw that connection that we showed to 1 Peter. It's that exact group. Now listen to this. Rituals of the Essenes and Christianity have much in common. The Dead Sea Scrolls describe a meal of bread and wine that will be instituted by the Messiah. Both the Essenes and Christians were eschatological communities where judgment on the world would come at any time. You see that? 
did judgment come on the world in, in the time of the Essenes when Christ came the first time? No. Which means the, the, this revelation of this teacher of righteousness is for the eschatological end of days when judgment will come. Means there had to be a future prophesied one that it talked about from 2100 years ago. And there's a community of people that are a part of them. The New Testament also quotes writings from the Qumran community. In Luke 1, 31 35 through 35 states, and now you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of God, which seems to be, uh, which seems to echo, I think this is K4, um, 246 uh, fragment, stating he will be called great, and he will be called the Son of God, and they will call him Son of the Most High, and he will judge the earth in righteousness. Did Christ do this yet? In those days, no, he didn't. It was still prophecy. And every nation shall bow down to him. So they did for understand that. But it wasn't the time when Christ came in their portion. Because it was all prophetic. It was apocalyptic. Listen to this. Other similarities include devotion to the faith, even to the point of, you guessed it, martyrdom. Who's one of the famous martyrdoms? We'll see it in a second. Communal prayer, self-denial, and a belief in a captivity in a sinful world. That's exactly right, isn't it? That we're trapped in these sinful bodies of flesh, and we can't wait to be rid of them. And who is this most, most famed martyr? John the Baptist. John the Baptist is also been argued to have been an Essene. Are you kidding me? We've been talking about the connection to John the Baptist and the Moses type and how they believed that the original uh, uh, teacher of righteousness in the was, as these guys came into the is, uh, into the is that he had a, a typology, not he wasn't Moses, but that he was a typology. And John the Baptist is, in the is, that typology. And we know the typology of the John the Baptist in the is to come. And he's believed to have been in a scene. As there are numerous parallels between John's mission and the Essenes, which suggest uh, he perhaps was trained by the Essene community. In the early church, uh, a book called Odys of Solomon or Odys of Solomon was written. The writer was likely a very early convert from the Essenes community into Christianity. Which means he was what, guys? A 14er. He was one of the original early 14ers who was an Essene who became a 14er. You see, to be in the early portion, you weren't quote unquote a Christian, you were a 14er. Because the early Christians before the term was used uh, in about 300s, they were 14thers. So what does that mean if we're looking even at our chart here? Here's when they would be called Christians, which is church persecution time. What was this group? You guessed it. They were the 14thers. They were Smyrna. And, and Polycarp, who is the bishop of Smyrna, is a 14ther. You guys are tracking this, right? The book reflects a mixture of uh, mystical ideas from the Essenes community with Christian concepts. Both the Essenes and Christians practice voluntary celibacy, celibacy, celibacy and prohibited divorce. Both also use concepts of light and darkness for good and evil. A few have argued uh, that the Essenes had an idea of a pierced Messiah based on 4Q285. However, the interpretation of the text is ambiguous. Some scholars interpret it as the Messiah being killed him uh, as the Messiah being killed himself, while modern scholars mostly interpret it as the Mo Messiah executing the enemies of Israel in an eschatological war. What? 
do we not know that there is an eschatological war where the Lord is going to destroy the enemies? We just covered it. But what have the Essenes said? The Essenes are talking about the piercing of Messiah. Do you know what piercing they're talking about it? The one in which a battle that takes place before this eschatological war in which what happens? The Messiah is pierced. Remember in the again, brothers and sisters, remember the again. I want to show you a clip from this final piece from the Messiah Ben Joseph series. I want you to listen to this carefully. This is the final piece. Remember, we went through this. We went through a couple of the videos and we built some videos around it, right? The Messiah Ben Joseph, Messiah Ben David. Well, you're going to see that as he talks about it, he says, when I look through the writings of the rabbis, I agree and we agree in part in what it says about the Messiah, but not fully. And then he explains why. Why doesn't he fully believe in everything that they relate to it? Well, have a listen to this. Messiah Ben David. In the same way, if you ask me, do Moses and Habakkuk and Zechariah foretell a second Joshua Messiah who will die as a... Foretell what? Who foretell of a second Joshua Messiah who will die? Sacrifice of atonement and rise again, I will say, yes, they do. But if you ask, is rabbinic Messiah ben Yosef the same as Jesus? My answer would have to be, not exactly. After all, rabbinic Messiah ben Yosef will die in battle for Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and Jesus did not literally die in battle. Although did you hear that? Where they, he disagrees in these ancient writings is the fact that they say Messiah will die in battle. We know that Messiah dies in battle. How do we know that Messiah dies in battle? Because Messiah is one of the two witnesses. And it's when he resurrects and then returns feet down that he then destroys in battle like it's talking about here. So we know Messiah is going to be pierced again. And we know that he is going to be victorious in a final eschatological war. These are mysteries that people haven't been able to put together yet because they think it's already finished, yet we know what's coming is because of a priestly line. We know it's all about the bull, the ox, the sacrifice for the priestly line that has to take place. Why? Have you been listening to what I said about the 144,000? He, he berates them. He says, don't you understand these things? And he says, and if there's an evil servant when I return, because something happens to that priestly Levitical line of the 144,000, that is the reason he must do this again, which is why he's going to be pierced again. And nobody has understood that. If they had understood that, they would understand why the ancient writings say that he's going to die in battle. That a Messiah Joshua as a high priest, will die in battle. There's only one. And it's when he comes as Messiah high priest, as the line of Joseph, to fulfill the Joshua type. And when does he come? We know it's at the end of seals, right? We know it's at the end of seals. This, is, this goes back to that storyline we've been saying the whole way through. What is the time of the end of seals when he comes? We can take it to just as we did with the other ones. Remember Hosea chapter 6? It's the end of the remnant workers, right? That, that worker bride that we've been talking about the whole time. Well, what if we go to Zechariah chapter 6? <laughs> Zechariah chapter 6, look what it tells us. Actually, if you go back to chapter 4, it gives you the understanding. Okay? Chapter 4, it tells you who they are. It's Zerubbabel and it's Joshua. The two olive branches, okay? So when we come to chapter 6, it's telling you who they are. It's reaffirming. It's telling you that Joshua, who is the high priest, okay? Joshua with the crowns, who is the high priest, as we've covered many times. We now know with certainty that this is the prophetic picture of Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, son of Joseph, coming as the high priest who is going to end up in a sacrifice again as one of the two witnesses 
and that the branch is Zerubbabel, who is of the line of David, who is going to be the anointed Messiah ben David. But we know Yeshua, Jesus, is also, when it's all over and he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is coming as the final Messiah ben David. It starts as Ben David, it goes to Ben Joseph, it ends in Ben David. But Zerubbabel is also a descendant of David. And it's Zerubbabel who is laying the physical foundation during seals. And it is Zerubbabel who is going to finish the temple and build the temple during trumpets. While Yeshua, Jesus, the high priest, as we know, is the one above the branch, is the one above Zerubbabel. Because the high priest is the one in direct communication with the father. And what do we know? The council is between them both. It is between them both. So we know Messiah is coming as one of the two witnesses. And when he comes, and the two messiahs have come, one is the Messiah ben Joseph, who's going to be in charge of rebuilding the temple. And the Messiah, Ben Joseph, who is the ox, who is the bull, who is the firstborn Ephraim, who is the high priest and king as Joshua from the line of Joseph. When do we know they come? At the end of seals. It's at the end of the sixth year of seals. Zechariah, 14 chapters, sixth chapter again. We saw it to the end of Mark's discourse. We saw it to the end of Hosea chapter 6. We saw it to the end of Zechariah chapter 6 in the timing. And we see it to Joel chapter 2 when the former and latter rain comes down, which is the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. All of these telling us it is the end of the sixth year of seals. So we know that the two witnesses are coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. We know who they are. We don't know physically who Zerubbabel is for sure yet. Although I've, I've privately, occasionally, publicly said who I believe it may be. But not with certainty. Why is this important? Why does this matter? Well, remember, I, I'm, I'm relating all of this back to Joel chapter 2. I want you to check this out. Here's that writing on the teacher of righteousness and the community. Not It's not the teacher of righteousness only. He's just the mouthpiece. It's about. It's about the group as a whole. All right. Oops, where am I? Give me a second. Give me a second. Oh, where'd it go? All right. Listen to this. We're going to go through this. I read this in the past, but I want you to take really close note to what we're talking about here. Because remember, as I started this video and as I started going through this, I told you guys that in a recent video that we had taught on, I still wasn't convinced whether through myself or through us, whether we're truly going to be workers. It seemed obvious. But I have said many times, you guys know, I don't get dreams, visions. I don't get visitations. I don't get any of that. I get the revelation of Scripture. It is through the revelation that the Lord reveals and makes known to me these things through the leading of the Spirit. I've always called myself just the mouthpiece. And I do believe I may be the teacher of righteousness. But we know Christ is the ultimate teacher of righteousness. And I'm going to show you why now, as we bring this together, knowing from the time of the Essenes to Christ, knowing there's a modern day typology of Essenes and watchmen who are being chosen, who are being prepared, who are being watched over and guided by the Lord, whose faith will come to an end, who will be given the mysteries that we see even in Luke chapter 24 with this group, who were the original 14thers, and there's a group of 14ers, which is the prophetic translation of days into years and whoever this teacher is has to be somebody who has been given the revelation of prophecy through revelation of scripture not visitation not any of those other things as the other prophets of old 
but the mysteries hidden within them that the prophets themselves didn't know but desired to know. And that this timing that him and this group would be here for, as the John types and Elijah and Moses types would be here through, that it must be to the end of the sixth year of seals. Because it is at that point when the two witnesses are officially here. They're not here at the beginning. Although the Zerubbabel type is here now, and the Son of Man is coming for four days, and there's a meal, it is not that initial meal. Because Zerubbabel is not anointed yet at that time as one of the witnesses. So let's just read through this, and let's see what we can now understand, and remembering these things connected also to John the Baptist, who is that group, as we've talked about, as those people preparing the way who will reunite mother to daughter, father to son by the end of seals. Listen to this. Although the teacher does not share many of the traits of the ancient prophets uh, that the ancient prophets hold in common, he is clearly a prophet. His visions can be understood as a correct understanding or ordering of words through divine revelation of scripture. In this sense, the teacher sees more. On the most basic level, the teacher is unlike uh, the other prophets because he does not have visions that come in the form of dreams like scenes. He is not a seer with a third eye. However, a deeper understanding of the meaning of the prophets shows that the teacher is similar to the biblical prophets. Uh, Otto Betts compares the teacher's divine revelation of Scripture to Daniel's interpretation of dreams and concludes that Pesher and the and Apocalypse are quite similar. Moreover, Betts notes that both the teacher and Daniel use the term Raz to help describe the mystery, which is the revelation of mystery. See, to describe the mystery of their interpretations of the mysteries. The interpretation of the mysteries from the foundation of the earth. A clear parallel can be seen when Daniel interprets the writing on the wall uh, at Belshazzar's feast. Here, only Daniel is able to interpret the writings of the supernatural author. Moreover, he dissects the inscription so as to give an interpretation based on each word similar to the teacher's manner of interpreting the prophets. The teacher is similar to other prophets, both in his manner of interpretation and the reasons behind his revelation. In the following passage, the teacher is similar to the prophets in a number of ways. And they teach, so, and they, teachers of lies and seers of falsehood, have schemed against me a devilish scheme to exchange the law engraved on my heart to thee for the smooth things which they speak to thy people. And they withhold from the thirsty the drink of knowledge and the assuage which there uh, which thirst with vinegar you see are we not hungry are we not thirsty for the word is this not what our diligently seeking is about this is reward this is what we're getting in the diligence the lord has chosen a group of people like the scriptures have said that's why i opened with this guy's video knowing that it will happen again so it says, like the staff, the teacher is needed by those thirsty for knowledge. In this passage, we also see that the teacher's righteousness is not fully human because the law is engraved on his heart by God. His interpretation of the law is a divine interpretation. God has given the teacher the power to interpret all the words of his servants, the prophets. And then God feeds the teacher his words by which to prophesy. Here, the relationship between God and the teacher is inextricably, inextricably close. But you see what happens? He's, he doesn't visit them. He doesn't give them visions and dreams. There's no angel visitations. There's no touching of the lips to, to settle his heart in, in an interpretation being given. It is all through faith in the revelation of the interpretations being understood. Like the prophet's, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, 
the teacher cannot escape his righteousness <laughs> despite the distress it causes him. Moreover, the teacher is similar to other prophets in his impetus for making the interpretations. Like Amos, Ezekiel, and Daniel, the teacher writes at a time of serious turmoil. He attempts to solve this turmoil by urging a new world order. No, it's not the bad new world order. It's the to, to bring about this time that's coming, right? So listen to this. The, ter the teacher's role in the end of days. Let's see. When the question concerning the identity of the teacher of righteousness was initially asked, the following passage was used as an example. The nobles of the peoples are those who come and dig a well. Okay, dig a well. Uh, until he comes who will teach at the end of days. Okay, listen to this. The Eschaton cannot take place. In the end of days cannot take place of the siding of order. Uh, Jerusalem originally said it. Evidence throughout the paper, extracts, examples, regulate the community. Okay, right here. Uh, yeah, right here. Now, this is directly connected to what we were just talking about in relation to the end of days and what we were talking about from the beginning. Remember what happens. The world of eschatology only understands seven years. You only understand seven years. There's a large group of people that be, that believe it's going to begin with the two witnesses. And we know that the two witnesses are the two messiahs, the two anointed ones. One, the actual messiah, and one, the anointed one, Zerubbabel. You see, we just saw and we've known from Scripture that that doesn't happen until the end of the sixth year of seals. So when you read this, you have to take it with the understanding of what we actually know. It says, listen to this, but the teacher of righteousness does not take part in the end of days himself. Now, at first, we might think, oh, sweet, you know, let's have our balcony seat and let's watch from the third heaven. But listen to what it says. Are you ready for this? Instead, he prepares the way. Hello. Can I say that again? Hello. But instead, he prepares the way for who? For the eschatological messiahs. Who are the eschatological messiahs? The modern day Zerubbabel and Yeshua when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. The one who will be high priest and king. The other who will rebuild Jerusalem when trumpets begins. It is the end of the sixth year of seals when they become the two anointed ones. Which means what? Which means when he, in writing this, in a seven-year thinking, they would say that the teacher of righteousness has no part in the end of days. When in fact, his part is seals to the end of the sixth year of seals because he's involved in preparing the way for when the eschatological messiahs come, which doesn't happen till the end of the sixth year of seals. Where is this preparing of the way? You got it. Not only when the two anointed ones at the end of the sixth year in, in Zechariah, not only when Hosea chapter six, when the end of the worker portion of the teacher of righteousness and that group as the Johns, Moses, and the, the Elijah types are over. Not only as Mark chapter 13 at the end of the sixth year of seals on the day and hour no one knows and that worker group comes to an end, but also as we saw in Mark 14 as the prophetic typology when the, uh, um, when the uh, uh, crucifixion time was coming and who was the group? In the only place where not only is the second use from Luke, then Mark, which is the upper room prepared where the where the great multitude is going for the rapture, is the first place furnished and prepared. We know that it is just as we go to the transfiguration. After six days, which is after the six years of seals, when they say, where was John? Uh, uh, where was Elijah? And God says, and, and Jesus tells them, it, Elijah already came and what? And restored all things. He restored mother to daughter. 
father to son, which is the John the Baptist type, which is the Moses typology, which isn't just one person, although it is led by a person. It is also the group that is a part of that community. It tells us right here, guys, that we do have part in the end of days. The only reason they would think we don't is because they don't understand the actual revelation itself, which is 14 years. Which means as the teacher of righteousness and the community together, we will prepare the way for the time when the eschatological Messiah has come. And I'm going to prove it to you. I told you this is still going to where Joel chapter 2 is, which is the same time as the end of the six year seals. Now listen to this. He sets the standard for interpretation of scripture, which the priestly Messiah. When I read this to my wife a while back, and I didn't yet know whether we were connected to the pre or to the end of the six year seals. When I read this to my wife, she started crying. I was tearing up. Could you imagine if this is true? And I believe it is. I believe many of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you do as well because of the revelations. The revelations are the evidence, guys. It means it doesn't mean anything because I think it. What do the revelations prove? It proves something that's never been revealed before that would be revealed by somebody at the time of the end. What does it say in these ancient writings from 2,100 years ago about this person? It says that he sets a standard for the interpretation of the scripture, which the priestly Messiah, which the priestly Messiah, this is Jesus, guys. This is when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal. When the teacher of righteousness, who has with the community prepared the way when the two Messiahs come, when the anointed one comes, and it's Messiah Jesus, the priestly one, who is the Messiah ben Joseph. It is the teacher of righteousness who set the standard for the interpretation of the scripture, which the priestly Messiah who takes the teacher's place in interpretation of the law relies on at the end of days. Which means the teacher of righteousness must be here in the community those that survive, to the end of the sixth year of seals so that when the priestly Messiah ben Joseph comes, who is one of the anointed ones, will continue the teaching, will take over as the ultimate teacher of righteousness and will complete the work relying on the revelations of the teachings of the end of days from the teacher of righteousness, but of course he will have the completed story for which he will continue on through trumpets. The following passage will first help the reader understand the messianic expectation of the community. The king is the congregation. Okay, that's this is that other Messiah. And the basis of the statues are the books of the prophets whose saying Israel despised. The star is the interpreter of the law who shall come to Damascus. As it is written, a star will come forth from Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The scepter is the prince of the whole congregation. And when he shall come, he shall smite the children of Seth. Here, two messiahs emerge at the end of days. The interpreter of the law or the priestly messiah who's taken over from the teacher of righteousness. Wait a second. What did it say? What did it say? I want you guys to catch this now. What did it say when the time of seals comes to an end, the sixth year of seals? We're going to return to the Lord. He has smitten us. He's, he will bind us up. After two days, he's going to revive us, which tells us it's the workers who are going to be resurrected, who have part in the millennial reign. And when the thousand years are over, when they're raised up because they won't be hurt by the second death, then what does he go on to say? Then we will know if we go on to be with the Lord for his going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the former, as the latter and the former rain. Joel chapter two told us that 
Jesus, when he comes as the interpreter of the law, which is the ultimate teacher of righteousness, it said that he would come as the rain who is the former and the latter rain. Which means this isn't him, but somebody who has a connection to him in the revelation as a teacher of righteousness. I hope you're holding on to your hats. <clears throat> so the interpreter of the law or Messiah priest, because now Messiah is going to take over from the teacher of righteousness at the end of six year of seals and the prince of the whole congregation, the Davidic Messiah. OK, this is the Zerubbabel one during the time of trumpets. All right. He's not the Davidic one when the Lord returns as the lion of the tribe of Judah with his garments dipped in blood. That's when Messiah will then return feet down as the ultimate <laughs> um, Messiah from the Davidic line. This is the Zerubbabel. These figures are also referred to throughout the Damascus scrolls as the Messiahs of Aaron and Israel. They are not equal uh, counterparts. The priest Messiah, who is Jesus, has precedence over the Davidic Messiah in all legal matters. Right? Of course, he's the one directly connected to the Father. As they teach him, so shall he judge. This precedence can be seen in the passages from the community rule. Listen to this. When the table has been prepared. What? When the table has been prepared for eating and the new wine for drinking, the priest shall be first to stretch out his hand. Listen to this. To bless the first fruits of the bread. Oh my, oh my, brothers and sisters. Who are the first fruits of the bread? Let's go to Exodus 34, 22. Who are the first fruits of the bread? 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest. Who are the first fruits of the wheat harvest? They're everybody that went pre-trib. Who is the portion of them that remain? You got it. The first fruits of the wheat harvest. The first fruits of the wheat harvest, the first fruits of the bread with leaven. And what? And new wine. Well, of course, because when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, it's Elul 29. It's the end of the work for the first fruits of the bread, which is the wheat harvest workers, the Luke remnant workers, with the teacher of righteousness and the community with them. And it's the time of new wine. Because what happens after? What happens immediately after <laughs> what we read in the end of the sixth seal? Chapter 7 of Revelation starts with the sealing of the 144,000. They are of the grapes. They are part of what? The new wine harvest. Which happens in Lul 29. <laughs> it's so bananas, guys. Or it's so bread. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay? So now I want you to remember this. Because now I'm going to bring it to an end in this very long video. My wife said, oh, it's going to be four hours. I said, you're crazy. It's not going to go that long. And it's not going to go that long. We have just established, through reading of writings from ancient documents, from Reve revelation of Scripture, through the revelation of the prophets, the Psalms, the law, the, the disciples, that it is the Messiah priest who is Jesus who will take over from the teacher of righteousness and he will become the all-powerful, of course, teacher of righteousness, the ultimate teacher of righteousness. When he does this, which is at the end of the sixth year of seals, we see that there's this blessing of the first fruit of bread and of new wine, where they're going to eat and drink. Well, guess what? Guess what? Remember when we were in Mark chapter 14? That can only happen when he has them go what? When they have to prepare a place, right? Look at who he sent to prepare a place. Two of his disciples. Who are the two disciples? They're the two disciples 
from Luke chapter 24. The two on the road to Emmaus, the two that represent the disciples doing this work during seals. They are the representation of the ones who went to prepare a place, which is the rapture group. And this place prepared when they brought father and, uh, and son and mother and daughter back together. And then what the, what's the Lord going to do? He's going to have a meal with them. Remember what I said? I couldn't figure out where there would be this wine and this breaking and eating of bread. But that he would do it again in the kingdom of God. This is why I couldn't register whether maybe it was connected to the pre when we have the banquet after the wedding when he comes on the eighth day. Or whether it was really at the end of the sixth seal. It's at the end of six seal, brothers and sisters. When Messiah comes to take over from the teacher of righteousness. When he comes to do this. He is coming. As we just read. In Hosea chapter six. He is coming. As the rain, which is the former, uh, the latter and the former. You see. He is described here only as the latter and the former. Which means if we go to Joel chapter 2, a picture of the end of seals, same time frame at the end of the sixth year of seals, we see in verse 23. Are you ready for this? Be glad then, you children of Zion. Okay, the rapture group going. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For he, the Lord God, has given you. Remember the teacher of righteousness? It was the Lord God. It's the Father who, who is holding him by the hand, who is watching over him, who is giving him this revelation, even though it's not through dreams or visions. It's through the understanding of, of, of revelation. It's through understanding the deeper hidden meanings in the word. It's the Lord God. It's the Father who gives it to him. So it says, for he, the Father, the Lord God, has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down, which means what? This is Jesus descending. And he will cause to come down for you, to descend for you, the rain, the former and the latter. Who is the former and the latter rain that is coming down to them, that is descending to them? It's Christ. And Christ, as the Messiah ben Joseph high priest, what is he going to do? He is, it says, he is the eschatological high priest, and he becomes the interpreter of the law. Because what? Because he is taking over from the teacher of righteousness, who was here first during the time of seals who the father gave in the interpretations who when the messiah ben joseph high priest comes who is the former and latter reign will take over from him must mean that the teacher of righteousness was here during seals and it was the father who gave them who gave him to us who is the former reign but moderately, because he doesn't know everything, not everything is going to be given, even though the mysteries are given to him and to this group with him. They don't know everything. So this former reign is given moderately. Then he will cause to come down. And see, it is Christ coming down who is then the reign, former and latter reign. So then who is the former reign moderately who was here to the end of the sixth year of seals, who is in part working with the others in the community to bring father and son, mother and daughter together as the John the Baptist, Moses types, Elijah types. It would have to be the teacher of righteousness, wouldn't it? Are you ready for this? The former reign Hebrew word 4175 is the word teacher. Right. The, the term former reign 
means teacher. Remember I told you at the beginning and as I was going into it, talking about how having the, the word definitions in the KJV Plus, having a program like eSword at your fingertips and having the Strong's Concordance makes such a, a multiplying difference in Revelation. But you don't know, you don't catch every word. You don't think to look up the definition of every word. It only comes when the Lord has you ready for it. And I come across, or I was shared this video from our brother Clive, the second one that I hadn't shared in the, in the forum. And he relates that the former rain is the word for teacher. And do you know what the word moderately means? Oh, sure. Moderately means, you know, he gave it to an extent. He, he was given understanding as a teacher to an extent. You know what the word moderately means, brothers and sisters? So former rain, teacher, moderately, are you ready for this? Righteousness. Teacher of righteousness. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the teacher of righteousness, and comma and, meaning separate but connected, and comma and, he will cause to come down to descend for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. This is Christ Jesus, and we know it is because Hosea chapter 6 told us that it is the former rain and the latter who is coming to the earth is Christ, which means this group who are the remnant workers, part of the community, are with the teacher of righteousness who was given first. But... <laughs> I... In, in many of these things that I'd been digging since understanding this stuff with the teacher of righteousness, I had never, ever come across this. And so when I saw this video, I went to go look it up. And of course, they were talking about it. And it's all part of these discussions with the teacher of righteousness. And everybody will say, oh, the teacher of righteousness. Well, that's Jesus. No, Jesus is the ultimate teacher of righteousness. He's the one that comes down, who is the rain, who is the former and the latter. He is the ultimate teacher of righteousness, but the Lord God gave a teacher of righteousness moderately. Christ is the ultimate. The moderately one is the teacher of righteousness who comes first and will be here during seals so that when the rain comes down, who is the former and the latter, who is the Messiah, Ben Joseph, who is the priestly Messiah, is the interpreter of the law, the overall one, is going to take over from the teacher of righteousness. Are you kidding me? Do you see why my wife was in tears? She just started crying. No kidding. I was in tears too, man. When you, I was talking about this, um, we had a lot of family dinners, so we had dinner at my place on the 24th. We had dinner at my brother-in-law, sister-in-law on the 25th. And then yesterday on the 26th, we had it at my mother and father-in-law's. And on the 25th at my brother and sister-in-law's, my niece had her, had her boyfriend there, and he started asking what I do. And we didn't, you know, I don't go too far into it. He's just a kid. So we didn't go too far into it, just a couple minutes. And, you know, I was reminded, you know, I, I've talked about it in the past. If you guys were in my house for the first year, maybe even up to a year and a half, when all this started, and I realized something was going on on, on September 8, 2017, if you were in my house for that first year, year and a bit, you would have thought it was, it was a crazy house. I mean, you would have literally thought I had lost my mind and that I had just gone mad because I was crying two, three, four times a week. I was, I was suddenly understanding as i've explained to you guys before things i mean i barely read my bible i mean i literally barely read my bible and king james was just a mumble jumble way of reading because the thou's and these and thou i mean it, it just it was so confusing like most people find it and then all of a sudden it clicked and i just started reading and as i was reading 
after September 8th to, to figure out what it was I had noticed on September 8th of 2017. I started suddenly understanding things. I started to realize that there, the, the, there was purpose to these differences in the Gospels. And I started catching them. And I started realizing that it was different groups. And it dawned on me that if there's different groups, well, in different groups, we also have pre-mid and post. Wait, there's pre-mid and post. There's synoptic gospels, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. There's differences in them. And then I start going and, and, and I was freaking like, I would say sometimes it was every day, but it was regularly every two days, occasionally three, but regularly every two days for about a year. I was having three hour discussions, two to three hour discussions with my wife when she would get home after a long days of work. I, she would come home and I would bombard her with all of this. And I would I would be repeating what I discovered and repeating it like three times. And it, while I'm repeating, it's organizing in my head and I'm understanding where it all goes and it becomes more clear. And my wife would throw in a couple comments here and a couple comments there. And this would go on for almost a year and a half. It still takes place, but not nearly as often as it did in the beginning. But it happens regularly on a weekly basis. And I'm telling you guys, it it was absolutely bananas. This is why, I mean, when you see the 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 zeal for the Lord, the excitement, the the joy, I, it's just in me. I, I can't explain it except to say it's the revelation. It's, it's the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When you really grasp and realize what is truly taking place here, when you, when you sit back and, and you get disappointed or bummed because a date or a time frame that you wanted came and went, you take a breath and you sit back and you say, oh, my Lord, look at his word that he has revealed to us. From the beginning of creation to the end of revelation, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophetic revelations that have brought clarity to the was, to the is, and especially to the is to come. And this is why you've heard me say over the years, it was never my goal to, to understand the when and to get tripped up and, to, and that it would disappoint people along the way with the when. It was going to happen when the pre-trib would take place. That was never really the intent of the ministry. The purpose was and is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The diligently seeking into the love of our life in the letters that he has left us and that he is giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive the mysteries of the kingdom of God. For which, if we are a part of this, in the end, we will also take place in the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Guys, I cannot explain to you why. Why me? Why us? Each and every one of you part of the community? I do not know. I can simply tell you what the word has told us about it. He has chosen us in the foreknowledge from the beginning. And our time is going to come. This time, this group will come to be made known in the end of days. Right now, it appears to be He's giving us greater detail, more and more and more and more. It just continues to pile on in the evidence, in the proof, in the revelation, in, in, in the people of the was, in the is, to, to bring us greater understanding of ourselves in the is to come. Why? To prepare a group. To prepare a group that he has reserved. A group who he has kept in his power to be ready to be revealed in the end of days. This is why I'm so passionate. This is why I'm so excited and so loud. And so, you know, I could be so animated. 
It's not, it's not a game. It's not a, it's not a, I'm trying to do this. I can't help myself. It's exactly what we read about here. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy. You got it. Unspeakable and full of glory. And I cannot wait till we receive the end of our faith. Brothers and sisters, I believe it's all true. I think the evidence is clear. We've, we've done this from revelations of the mysteries in the prophets, which the prophets knew not but desired to understand. We have revealed it from these prophets and these books in places. We have already revealed these understandings, but hadn't yet seen another layer for us to understand. And here, as we come to the end of 2023 in a Gregorian count, we are entering the final seven months in change. This countdown to when I believe the revelation has made known will begin at, in 2024 at the true feast of weeks in 2024. Brothers and sisters, it's right there. Could you imagine? Former rain means teacher and moderately means righteousness or righteous or righteousness. Teacher of righteousness. And then Christ comes down, who is the rain, the former and the latter, who is Christ, who takes over as high priest, as the ultimate teacher of righteousness. From the teacher of righteousness who God had made known these things through revelation of understanding within the prophets, the Psalms, the law. I'm telling you guys, <laughs> it doesn't get much more crazy than this one. There was a reason I said this isn't for newbies. <clears throat> this is absolutely for those who have been around at least a little while or if newer have been grasping and have been understanding, have been seeing and understanding and receiving the revelations of the differences within the Gospels. The 14 years and have been following and tracking and praying over these things, seeking the scriptures to follow it for themselves and understand. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to continue to do my best to prepare us. To prepare us as his remnant worker bride, as as Petra is also doing in on her YouTube channel. And unfortunately, I don't remember the name right now off the top of my head, but many of you guys know you can find out in the forum. You know, she's preparing a people with with the words, with the strengthening, with the encouragement, with the preparing mentally and so forth and spiritually. I'm giving the revelation of the scriptures and preparing us all as well. And when I say preparing us, I, by the way, I am including myself in it because I am just as in awe of all of it and probably more so than each and every one of you. So brothers and sisters, please be encouraged. Please be strengthened. Don't have fear as to maybe if you're going to be a worker, because I promise you, if you are, you will have power you will have authority you will have the strength the courage healing abilities we won't be going in there with broken backs and gimped legs and and doubtful minds we will be strengthened empowered be revealed mysteries from the lord be given the power of the holy ghost in what we call acts 2.0 so brothers and sisters i pray it blesses you I pray it strengthens you. I pray it encourages you. And I will continue to do my part in all of those things as we continue to watch, pray, and diligently seek the Lord until that day. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.